So you can re, you can rewatch these videos, or if you know someone who missed the conference, they can come back and rewatch these videos. Um, but I'm also going to ask as students, um, again, make sure your name is visible in your profile. Uh, that way I can quickly identify you and set you up if when it's your turn to present. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to disable chat for everyone, but you can chat, you can do questions uh, during the presentation. They'll go straight to me. And if you would like, I will then either call on you to ask your question and I will unmute you to ask a question when it's that time. Or if you would like for me, if you don't have a working microphone, you may you know, say that in the chat, say, could you ask this question on my behalf? And I will do that for you. Uh, but I'm going to disable chat as to not interfere with the students uh, while they're presenting. Um, so I will see any questions you might have and I will open the floor to questions of the end students. Uh, hopefully, Dr. Cardenas has already told you, uh, you will have about 20 minutes to present and then 10 minutes for Q&A. Around the last five minutes of that Q&A, the next group will be getting set up. So make sure for those, you know, if you're presenting next, go ahead, get everything ready. During that time, I'll try to start transitioning uh, those students to become co-hosts so they can present. And we will try and make this run as smoothly as possible. And for the student presenters, I will keep track of time. We'll try and start exactly on the dot here. So we will get started in a little less than eight minutes. Okay, it is 1.22 on my clock right now. And I will give you about a two minute warning to remind you to start wrapping things up. Um, and I'll, I will cut you off if I need to, so we have time for questions at the end. So please keep track of time, but I will give you a two minute warning as well. And then we will proceed with the next presentation. We're going to try and start everything on time. So again, for those students who are just coming in, please make sure your name uh, is on your your uh, screen here or your profile pic or something that way i can easily find you and designate you as a co-host when it is your turn to present See a lot of family and friends in our audience today, so welcome all. Uh, thank you again for being here, supporting uh, your, your child, your friend, your, your relative. Um, I'm sure they are grateful that you are here. I'm grateful that you're here. And, and I know this is less than ideal circumstances, but we're gonna make it work and I think we're gonna have a good time today, so. Okay, so to our first team, as well as all of our students, again, make sure you have everything ready, have your presentation uh, ready to go. Um, make sure that your microphone is on. Um, I encourage you to turn on your video feed. You're not required to, but I do encourage it. Um, and if you do have a specific questions before you present, please text me in the chat here uh, so we can address those issues before it's your turn to present.
you're not aware of it, there is a, uh, a conference program, a PDF of that. I'm gonna go ahead and put a link of that in the chat if you would like to download it and read the descriptions of our presentations today. So again, this is the safety session for the mechanical engineering uh, senior design projects. You can look through that, see sort of a little abstract, uh, as well as our presenters and their sponsor and advisor on that program. Again, for those who just came in, welcome. This is the Mechanical Engineering Senior Design uh, Projects. This is the safety session. And I am the moderator. My name is Dr. Lewis Reese. Again, welcome all, uh, and thank you for being here. Again, if you are just joining us, there is a program that you can download, a PDF, that gives the abstracts, as well as the student presenters, their project sponsor and project advisor, all that. I have that in the chat, so I'll put it again in case you don't see that. And during our presentations, if you ever have a question, um, you may chat, you may write down that question in the chat on Zoom here. It will go directly to me as to not interfere with the students. And either I can call on you when it's time for questions, or if you would like me to, if you don't have a working microphone, I can ask the students that question for you. Um, but otherwise, we can also do um, a typical sort of hand raising gesture um, at the end of each presentation. So again, welcome to our council members as well. Thank you for being here. And again, to the family and friends who are also here, thank you again for being here supporting our students and their projects. They did a tremendous good job uh, especially given the circumstances that arose this quarter. Um, they did a, a very great job of putting everything together. And I hope that you will be pleased with their work as I was. Um, and they're gonna show off what they were able to do in that time frame. Okay, it is 129, so we will go ahead and introduce our first group. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you guys. Okay, so our first group is our propellant mixing stand. Okay, so gentlemen, um, I'll let you, you are able to share the screen right now, uh, and I'll go ahead and start the time whenever y'all get started speaking. Everybody ready? I'm ready. We have uh, audio from everybody. You're good to go. All righty. Uh, well, first off, I'd like to welcome everybody to the 2020 Senior Design Conference as we are the first group presenting. Um, we are the Patriot Propellant Mixing Stand for Continuous Mixing Team. Our project was sponsored by Aerojet Rocketdyne, and our sponsor contact was Miss Katie Curtis, who was a Louisiana Tech alumni that graduated last year in mechanical engineering. Um, my name is Ryan Black, and my team members are Michael Clark, Jason Hall, and Chris Palm. So before we get into the meat of this presentation, we just kind of like to introduce our sponsor, Aerojet Rocketdyne. They are an American missile and rocket propulsion manufacturer. And the specific branch that we were in contact with was located in Camden, Arkansas. And in case you're wondering, some of their biggest customers are NASA and the US Department of Defense. So as you can guess, uh, Aerojet primarily makes rocket fuel and uh, pictured in figure one is one of the mixers inside of the mixing building um, on their property in um, Camden, Arkansas. This is actually one of the smallest buildings and mixing units that they have. Um, so today in our presentation, we're going to go over the current process 
how this mixing process works, and we're going to go over problems that can be uh, better to increase the productivity of their mixing process. We're going to go over design constraints, constraints, which were parameters that we had to work within in order to successfully complete this project. We're going to show three conceptual designs that we came up with transitioning into the final design that we went with, um, as well as engineering standards and analyses that we used to prove that this final design was the best and that it would work. And then at the end, we will look at recommendations to Airjet, how they can take this project, project and continue it to completion. So starting off, we're going to look at some key terms. These are helpful to follow along with the presentation. Um, on the top on figure, well, the picture on the left, we have the catwalk. Um, that's pretty important. Next, we have the entry port, which is in the middle on the picture on the left and on the top on the picture on the right. Um, that's very important to remember where the entry port is and what it is. Um, we'll explain a little more later. Um, then we have the mixing bowl. The mixing bowl slides on a track back into the mixing bay, which is right under the mixing blades. So we're going to go ahead and move into the current process. Um, what is going on right now? So at the start of the day, the workers will put a liquid component into that mixing bowl. And then before anything happens, they have to leave that building, the mixing building, before any of that mixing process occurs due to explosion risks. So the workers have to leave that building and go to a bunker off-site that's safe in case of, a, a case of an explosion. So again, the workers put liquid component into that mixing bowl and then by hand push it under the mixing stand. The workers then exit the building, go to that bunker, and from there, there's a control panel that they use to raise the mixing bowl and start the mixing process. Once it's mixed for the allotted time, they will pause the mixing process and lower the mixing bowl. Then they'll enter the mixing building and by hand, pull that bowl back out. Then the workers get a, uh, a screen and have to sift a certain particulate down to a certain particulate size and then add that sifted particles into the mixing bowl, which point they push the mixing bowl back under the mixer, leave the mixing building, and go back to that safe bunker and then engage the mixing process. Once this is done, they will then lower the mixing bowl, go into the building, pull it out by hand again, and then it's done. As you can see, there's that middle step that's wasting a lot of time and therefore money of the workers having to pause the mixing process, go into the building, and then come out again. So what Airjet wants us to do is introduce a Suico machine. Where the workers um, hand sift that material, the Suico machine is a vibratory screener that will do this for them so that the workers never actually have to go back into the building. The Suico will sift that particulate to the specified particle size. It will drain by gravity through a rubber boot that particulate into the entry port as mentioned earlier. So our team is tasked with making a platform that will have the Suico machine sit high enough that's over the entry port and will drain it into from the Suico into the entry port. So next we'll move into some design constraints which are Again, the parameters that we had to work within. We had limited design space because, as I mentioned earlier, this was their smallest mixing building. So we have to design it in a way that the workers can still move about their normal operations without this platform being in the way. Um, we also had to make the platform big enough so that the workers have sufficient operational space on top of the platform when they're moving around the Suico machine before the mixing process starts. Um, we were given a maximum vertical deflection of any of our structural members by Aerojet of 0 0.031 inches. And that's their, uh, their company standard, so we just have to abide with that. Next, um, we look at our beam configuration to avoid particle buildup. The, uh, we have lots of explosion risks because we're mixing an explosive material. And so we have to make sure that all of the particulate that might float around in the air doesn't gather anywhere, such as I-beams. So we configure our beams in a way that can avoid any particle buildup to reduce explosion hazards. So for this project, uh, we came up with three design concepts. This one you see here is design one, Apollo. Uh, we designed it so that the platform was level with the catwalk and put the stairs in the back right corner of the facility to optimize the space around the casting stand, table, and scale. Um, this is a high foot traffic area, so we thought putting it back there would, would give them the most um, space, both ground level and above. However, um, our sponsors did not like this design because the platform was one, too high. Uh, they did not want to make excessive alterations to the pre-existing platform. And also the stairs were not easily accessible. Um, design two, Challenger, um, was also thrown out because of the same reasons. The platform was too high. 
and the stairs were not easily accessible, also being located in the back right corner. Um, so this brings us to design three. This is um, Atlas, which was chosen to be our building block for the final design. Um, the platform was lowered, making access to the entry port easier to obtain, and the stairs are moved to the right side of the platform, allowing for easier access. And this is our final design. Um, design three was altered by moving the stairs to the left-hand side of the platform. Uh, an emergency ladder was added to the front right, and a, a ladder leading to the catwalk was placed in the back for access. This also optimized the, the space around the workstation as well. Um, and this is our final design prototype. It was 3D printed using PLA plastic. Um, the prototype is an 11 to 1 scale. Um, for reference, all the legs here are 7.71 inches and the actual size is about seven feet. Um, and here are some engineering standards we followed for this project. From the Occupational Safety and Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA for short, we followed their standards for industrial stairs, fall protection systems, and column anchorage. Next, from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, we followed their section regarding to the welding qualifications. And finally, the American Weld Society standards for structural welding. Okay, today I'm going to talk to y'all about um, the engineering analyses we ran on our platform. Um, today I will talk about the beam selection, beam deflection, the shear design, uh, buckling analysis, and a vibration or frequency analysis. The first three analysis we ran were all focusing on the main central support beam depicted in figure four. We chose this beam because unlike any other beam, this beam particular would be under the most loading due to it would have to support the Suico machine. And so going on to beam selection, we want to look at this main central support beam a little bit closer. Here's that main central support beam here again. Um, so when designing, we want to design a beam that can withstand a worst case loading scenario. And so this is what we picture for the worst case loading scenario possible. Um, we picture that this middle central support beam would hold the weight of the Suico, which is 200 pounds. We would also want to account for the weight of the workers. For our worst case loading scenario, we imagine 1,200 pounds of workers standing directly in the middle of this central beam. Additionally, we have a distributed load of 5.5 pounds per foot over this beam. This accounts for the diamond plated aluminum flooring that will be placed on top of the platform. And so we can evaluate these loads and account for and calculate their reaction forces and reaction moments on each end or torques for each end. So evaluating these loads, we can solve for a beam, the beam section modulus. And the section modulus is a geometric property used to gauge uh, how strong a cross section of your beam is. So the section modulus, the formula for that is the max moment or torque applied to the beam from the loads applied to it multiplied by your factor of safety. The factor of safety expresses how much stronger system is than it needs to be for an intended load. We reached out to our sponsors and they expressed they wanted a factor of safety of five. So we incorporated that into our equation. And all of this will be divided by the yield stress, which is the maximum amount of stress the beam can take before it permanently deforms. And so we've calculated the section modulus based off of those worst case loading scenarios to be 2.4 inches cubed. Um, moving on, now that we have the section modulus, we can go to a list of beams that we have available to us. And each of these beams have property values specific to those beams. One, one of those property values is section modulus. And so we selected a section modulus twice as strong as the, re the required section modulus, which is 5.5 inches cubed. We chose a W4 by 13 beam. Um, the four stands for the depth of this beam, which is four inches, and 13 accounts for the weight, which is 13 pounds per foot. Um, we chose ASTM 836 carbon structural steel um, to make up to, for the material for this beam, and we chose this material based off of its mechanical properties such as yield strength. And so now that we have the beam selected, we can revisit the worst case loading scenario. We can, so, and solve for deflection. Um, so as, as we've had before, we had the weight of the Suico machine, which is 200 pounds. 
on this main central support beam. We also had previously 1,200 pounds of workers standing directly in the center of this beam. Now to account for the surrounding um, support beams that would be attached to this platform to help hold up the floor, we added the weight of 500 pounds onto that 1,200 pound center weight. So now we have a total of 1,700 pounds directly in the center under this worst case loading scenario as well as previously we had the 5.5 pounds per foot um, distributed across the beam which accounted for the weight of the floor but now that we've selected the beam we can choose the weight of the beam itself or we can add on the weight of the beam itself so now we have 19 pounds per foot distributed across this beam and so we can reevaluate these loads and solve for the reaction forces solve for the torques at each end and solve for the deflection this gave the beam a max deflection of 0 0.028 inches, which fell within the tolerance that, our, um, that Aerojet Rocketdyne gave to us, which was 0 0.031 inches. And so to um, double check our hand calculations, we ran the same uh, calculations into a computer software uh, called SolidWorks. Uh, this software used a finite element analysis to solve for deflection. So here, figure nine depicts that same central support beam under those same worst case loading scenarios. This is what that actual deflection would look like to the human eye. And figure 10 just shows an exaggerated, um, sh shows an exaggerated picture of that deflection to show where on that beam are we getting the most deflection. The last uh, engineering analysis I'll be speaking about today is the shear analysis. We wanted to make sure under the worst case loading scenario that our main central support beam wouldn't shear. And so based off of the beam's uh, mechanical properties and the cross section, we were able to calculate the allowable shear stress. And the allowable shear stress we calculated to be 24,000 pounds. And so looking back at the worst case loading scenario that would be applied to this beam, the max shear force uh, this beam would encounter would be only be 1,100 pounds. So we're not expecting this beam to shear. <clears throat> So the next engineering analysis that we're going to be talking about is another deflection analysis, except this time we'll be focusing on the deflection of the diamond plated aluminum flooring and more specifically these unsupported areas marked in figure 12 where the flooring is not directly supported by one of the steel support beams. So as you can see in the figure below, we have a free body diagram of the diamond plated aluminum flooring. Once again, we have a 1200 pound point load located at the center of the platform as a worst case loading scenario. And this is simply the weight of the workers and the 5.5 pounds per foot once again represents the uh, distributed load of the diamond plated aluminum flooring. So using this figure, we were able to calculate the max deflection of any one of those unsupported squares uh, located on our platform. And that maximum deflection uh, was equal to 0 0.016 inches, which is very well within our allowable deflection given by Aerojet of 0 0.031 inches. Next, we're gonna be looking at one of the support columns. When we're looking at the support column, which is highlighted in red in figure 14, um, we're assuming that it's anchored to the floor and doesn't actually have any more support members on it, even though the actual platform, as you can see, is providing extra support. So our first analysis we looked at was a lateral deflection, which is how much can that column bend before it becomes critical? Well, we determined an allowable lateral deflection from an equation that comes from the book called the American Institute of Steel Construction Serviceability Guidelines for Steel Structures. This equation is commonly used in engineering applications and it gave us a lateral deflection allowable of 0.43 inches. To calculate what deflection our column would actually experience, we looked at, again, that column isolated by itself to help represent a, um, an absolute worst case loading scenario. We looked at um, maybe a worker tripped and grabbed the guardrail or tripped and fell and put a sideways force onto the top of the platform, which would then translate into that column bending it sideways. So we looked at 350 pounds, which is way more than it will actually ever experience. And with that extreme worst case loading scenario, our column still only deflects 0.22 inches which is almost half of the allowable deflection. So we know that we will not fail due to lateral deflection. Next, looking at that same column, we look at buckling, so the buckling of the column. To determine what a critical buckling load for this column is, we look at an equation that comes from our statics textbooks, and it really incorporates the material properties, such as modulus of elasticity, 
um, as well as the geometry of the beam, which would, or the column, which would be the length of the column or the width of the column to see how much force does it take before that column is going to fail due to buckling. And that force was determined to be 110,000 pounds. And so we looked at our column and we looked at the weight of the workers, the weight of the Suico, and the weight of all the structural members combined into one as a point load on top of one column. And all of those loads still only get to 2,200 pounds, which is nowhere near our critical buckling load. So we know for sure that we will not fail due to buckling. And so for our last engineering analysis that we uh, conducted on our static platform, we did a vibration and frequency analysis. This is due to the fact that the Suico machine uh, is a vibratory screener, therefore it operates uh, within a certain frequency range. And after talking to our sponsor, they informed us that the Suico would operate anywhere between 20 to 60 hertz. Therefore, we thought it would be best to determine the critical frequencies of all of our material components within our structure. Therefore, we decided to focus on our two main uh, structural components, which is our structural steel beams and our diamond plated aluminum flooring. So as you can see, uh, the structural steel beams had a critical frequency of 130 Hertz and the diamond plated aluminum flooring had a critical frequency of 1400 Hertz, both of which are well above the maximum operating frequency that the Suico could experience. Uh, and so after we completed our engineering analysis, we then turned to do a cost analysis on how much it would cost Aerojet to actually fabricate our design. So here we have a very summarized production budget. Um, after our presentation in our appendixes, we do have a very detailed production budget. Um, but here we just focus on some of the main uh, materials such as our structural steel beams, our flooring, our railings and safety systems. Uh, our miscellaneous items, uh, these include our anchor bolts that will attach the uh, steel platform to the concrete located within the mixing building and the fabrication costs, which is mostly due to welding and cutting. Um, and so after summing all these together, our total production cost for Aerojet is roughly $11,780. Thank you, Sheriff. Two more minutes. And so finally, uh, we have our recommendations that we would like to give to Aerojet as they move forward with our final design. Uh, our first recommendation is that they use a W4 by 13 wide flange H-beam. And this is due to all of our engineering analysis that we previ previously discussed as the beam passed every single test that it was put up against. Uh, secondly, we asked that Aerojet use the beam configuration that was displayed in figure 12 of this presentation. And this is to ensure that the diamond plated aluminum flooring in those unsupported areas will not deflect more than their allow allowable deflection of 0 0.031 inches. And finally, as far as materials go, we recommend that Aerojet uses ASTM A36 steel and 6061T6 diamond plated aluminum flooring for the main material components of the platform. And this is due to their high critical frequencies that way it will prevent the structure from uh, receiving damage while the Suico is in operation. And this now concludes our presentation of our Patriot propellant mixing stand. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you, speakers. So again, at this point, um, you may ask questions. You may put the questions in the chat, or if you would like to speak up, um, you can uh, raise your hand or flag me down and I will unmute you and you may ask your question. I'll go ahead and ask the first question, gentlemen. Okay. Um, so you you looked at the deflection of the floor, uh, the plating there. Um, is that plating going to be secured to the beams or is it just resting on top of the beams? Um, it will be secured to the beams. It will be, um, it will be should be pinned down. Um, okay. the so did y'all calculate any kind of, you know, moment that, that's going to occur on top of those beams, you looked at the deflection of the plating, but what about any kind of uh, stress at the uh, the connections at, the, at those joints? Um, within this past quarter, um, we we was beginning to look into it due to time constraints. We never finished on that, but that's something we definitely can go back and calculate for our co sponsor. So we got a question from Leslie. Let's see here if I can find you. Hello, 
Leslie, you may ask your question. I've unmute you. Unmute you. Awesome. Thank you. Great job, guys. At the beginning of the presentation, you did mention that you were concerned about particle accumulation for this particular propellant. Did we actually do anything to prevent that accumulation? Uh, Ryan, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so just whenever we constructed our um, actual platform, we set our I-beams up in an I formation rather than like an H formation. Uh, that way, in case there was some particle buildup, it would be easily accessible to uh, workers to be able to clean that off. Rather, if we had laid it out in an H formation, there could be particle buildup, uh, say, underneath the diamond-plated aluminum flooring. They could be, there could be particle buildup uh, within that little channel, and then the aluminum flooring is placed above it, and there would be no way to uh, clean up that particle buildup or extract it. And therefore, in case there was some sort of spark to occur during the mixing process, uh, then there would not be as big of an explosion as if there were if we had uh, laid our beams in that uh, configuration. To add on to her question, was there any discussion about possibly modifying the original I-beam, either putting some kind of sheet or some other protection around it, or even curving it so you don't have those sharp corners for buildup of the uh, propellant. Ryan. Okay, um, so uh, after talking with our sponsor, uh, kind of their in-home process as far as pre uh, preventing uh, that particle buildup is they apply a special layer, a special coating to all the I-beams uh, before they are uh, fabricated together. And another thing that they do is every uh, single piece of the structure is fully welded together. So they take these uh, I-beams offsite, weld them together in a clean environment uh, and make sure that the welds are secure before they move them into the mixing building. And that way this prevents any particle buildup in say a, a cracked weld or anything of that sort. Okay. So we have a question from AJ Weller. Um, I'll ask for him. Did you guys consider rectangular tubing? Um, Michael, do you want to answer this? Yeah, sure. Um, so the company Aerojet specifically requested that we do not use any sort of tubing. Um, they try to avoid any sort of tubing in their other buildings due to if there's any imperfection and there's a way for material to get into that tube, whether horizontally or vertically, um, there will be particle buildup and we could potentially not know about it. And like Ryan mentioned, if there was a case of a spark, the explosion would be much greater than had we not used tubes and been able to see that accumulation and clean it up. Thank you. We have any other additional questions from our audience? Again, you may either just mention in the chat you'd like to ask a question or you can write your question in the chat. We got a question from Kirk Backwelder. Kirk, you're free to speak. Great, thank you. Uh, great job, guys. Uh, thanks for presenting today. Uh, I noticed that you used some diagonal uh, uh, members in the structure. Uh, what led you to, to uh, implement those? Was that something that kind of a late ad? Was it a, uh, just kind of looking for your background on that? I didn't see much in the, the way of analysis on that. Okay, uh, Chris, do you want to take this one? Yeah, so uh, let me pull that up again for you. Um, so these these beams, we added this uh, as as structural support, and yes, this was an add that was added later. Um, so then we we felt this would also help with um, preventing that uh, deflection on the top. Um, we didn't put anything on the sides just because they have um, piping that runs on the sides there. If the piping wasn't there, we obviously would have added no supports. Um, but we didn't do any uh, analysis on those angled beams. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I actually want to add to that question. I, I forgot to ask this. Um, so you said the, the clearance height here as well, just over seven feet, right? Right. Okay. Um, so what is the clearance height at the bottom of that diagonal member there? Is there any risk of possibly head trauma or, or workers forced to wear safety elements on site or? Okay, um, Michael, do you wanna take this one, bud? Yeah, sure. So 
that was one of our original concerns was that if workers have to move in and out of there, um, they don't always have to wear hard hats inside of the buildings and they could hit their head. Um, there's also lights that are in there. And so we brought that up to Aerojet and they said that the workers are very rarely under the platform and that they would rather have the platform lower to be closer to that entry port for that tube to go from the Suico to the entry port rather than have that extra clearance because it's very rare that people walk under there. So that was Aerojet's require or suggestion to us and uh, they wanted that, the lower platform. So the, are they able to move the mixing bowl just by standing directly behind it? There's no need for a two person uh, team build, anything like that? Right. Correct. It's on very smooth sliders, so they're able to slide it all the way in. Do we have any more questions? All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. And thank you for everyone for the questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and mute our old speakers and our new speakers. We'll go ahead and get them set up. Okay. Is Dylan here? There you are. Yeah, it looks like he's here. Okay, he is. So again, for our speaker or our students, um, if you don't mind, do me a favor and make sure your full name, first and last name is in your profile. Uh, that way I can quickly identify you and make you a co-host and unmute you when it's your turn to speak up. So we got a few more minutes. We got, we'll start exactly at two o'clock. We'll stay with the schedule for anyone who's coming in and out of these meeting rooms. Uh, and again, for those, if you just came in, this is the safety session of the Mechanical Engineering Senior Design Conference. If you have questions during the presentation, you may type questions during the presentation uh, they will go directly to me as to not disturb the student presenters. And you may either ask to request permission to ask a question at the end, or you may just write your question in the chat and I can ask it on your behalf. And so for any of our student groups who may have came in a little late, uh, remember, you have 20 minutes to present. Um, I'll give you a little wiggle room, but try and meet that 20 minute uh, time period. Um, I'll give you sort of a verbal two minute warning uh, about that time. So try and make sure you, you wrap it up around there. And that will give us about 10 minutes for Q&A. In the last five minutes of the Q&A, the next group, we will start preparing them um, for their presentation to start on time. And if you did just came in, do note that this uh, session is being recorded. That way you can go back and review this presentation or if you have family and friends who missed out, uh, there will be a link posted sometime in the future where they can go back and watch the videos of our student presenters. Okay, so we'll go ahead and present our next group, the Bagger Tube List System by Colton, Dylan, Joe, and Stuart. Guys, y'all are now co-hosts on Muted, so one of you can uh, go ahead and share your screen and we'll get started soon. Thank you. Hey. You may start, gentlemen, whenever you're ready. All right, everyone has a, uh, can hear us all? <clears throat> I can hear you. So our team is the Bagger Tube Lift System, and my name is Dylan Sequera. I was the lead for this quarter. And then we had uh, Stuart and Colton, who are designers. And then Joe Pusateri was procurement. And then our project, you know, our uh, sponsor for the project was Derek Newman. He's a project engineer over at Lamb Wesson. And then our faculty advisor was uh, Dr. Jaganathan, who's an associate professor at Louisiana Tech. So a little uh, overview about the company Lamb Wesson. They are a sweet potato production facility. And the facility that we're working with is in Delhi, LA. 
and they specialize in the production of sweet potatoes for a few various brands. And uh, to get an overview of what a bagger tube is, uh, it can be seen in the photos on the left. And there are four sizes of tubes in the facility and then two different styles. And the tube pictured on the left side is the smaller style. And they have a four inch and then a eight inch tube for that. And it's measured by the size of the bag openings for the fries. And then they also have the tube on the right, which is the lar larger style design. And then uh, the bagger tubes are constructed fully from stainless steel. And the largest size tube that needs to be lifted is 75 pounds. So this photo on the left kind of shows an overview of what the tube would look like in the machine inside the facility. And you can see the tube is highlighted in yellow. And then uh, the photo on the right side shows the tube, how it's mounted inside the machine, a close-up view. And what's highlighted in purple is the receiving rails. And the tube slides into those, pushed all the way back into a stopper. And then those red handles are closed and lock it in place. And then you can see how the bag forms around what we've been calling is the cape and it circles around the bottom of the tube and the machine crimps the bag off and it can follow the production line out. So Lamb Weston approached our team with a problem. Their current method of changing the bagger tubes was slow and unsafe. The bagger tubes require frequent changing and can prove to be very labor intensive. Changing tubes by hand also imposes safety hazards from not only overhanging weight but the sharp edges that tend to form around after the bag or tube, after the bag material has ran for quite some time. Our team came up with a solution to take the human physical factor out by designing a machine to raise the tube 37 inches into its proper positioning. Pictured on the right hand side is the is Lamb Weston's current lift. It's uh, basically semi, uh, semi manual where the uh, operator still has to push the tube into position. So here's a short video of that machine. Um, this is their current method. This machine uh, they're using is really cumbersome to position. So most employees choose not even to use it. As you'll notice, the uh, controls of this machine are very touchy. And this, this particular operator has used this machine many, many times. So they're not, you know, this is not a new operation to them. And they're technically pretty good at it. There you see the receiving rails that Dylan talked about earlier with the two red handles. And as she pushes the bagger tube out, out farther, she has to keep her hand on the bottom pretty much the entire time to keep the uh, bagger tube from rotating forward. And also she has her hand in between the machine and the bagger tube, which creates potential pinch points, which is also another safety hazard. There you saw a second ago, the bagger tube trying to rotate forward. It's pretty much locked in place right here though. And now she's pushing the machine out. Okay, so we were given some design constraints. Um, we had limited access, not only between the bagger tube mounting point and uh, the conveyor belt, but also between packaging lines. Um, we must meet all the material requirements for the final design, aka stainless steel, which is corrosion resistant. Um, the machine has to be easy to clean with minimal crevices that, uh, so we make sure no foreign objects and food can build up in. And also the design has to be affordable. So here's our deliverables. Our speed has to be less than two and a half minutes, which is the current manual, uh, manual installation speed. Uh, safety aspects have to have few pinch points and the machine has to be sturdy. And for ease of use, it has to be an ergonomic design and easy to maneuver around the facility. This is our final design of the bagger tube lift. It stands 91 inches tall with a 40 by 28 inch base. And it contains an actuator, dual drum winch and a 12 volt battery. On the left is our rendering with the main component callouts, and the components will be reviewed in detail in the upcoming slides. On the right is our final prototype with the bagger tube attached. 
presented here are early design alternative considerations. Uh, the first row shows alternative ranges of motion. The second row is our connection mechanism. And row three shows options for the drive mechanisms. A design matrix was created for each of the categories and all alternatives were given a rating. The second column box in red contains the selections for our final design. Here you can see a 3D model and a photo of the lift space. As you can see, the base houses the battery, the winch, and control panel for the system. On the pick, you can also note the bolts where the tower is mounted. This shows some of the uh, engineering analysis we performed on the base. We determined the bolts hold the highest levels of stress. By calculating the moment, we found the top bolts held the high, largest forces by uh, following the proper calculations, we determined the bolts to have a factor safety of nearly 90. So shown in the center is the system that provides vertical motion. As shown in red, the uh, upper and lower cables, these uh, uh, provide optimal force in both directions to ensure smooth raising and lowering. Also, three-quarter inch chrome plated guide rods also help with counteracting the mount, uh, the moment and lower in friction. In the middle of the frame is uh, what we call the carriage. This is the mounting point for the horizontal arm and also houses uh, minimal, friction, minimal friction surfaces as well. Shown at the top is the sheave. This is uh, basically redirecting the force from the cable that comes off of the winch. <clears throat> so here's our performance evaluation. For our uh, performance evaluation, we performed five time trials. The trials consisted of raising, lowering, and extending the machine to simulate change in a tube. As shown on the right-hand side, the average time was around 63 seconds for each cycle, which is well below our two and a half, two and a half minutes required. So this is our carriage. And as you can see inside the red square, that's where it's shown. Uh, the carriage provides a mounting point for the horizontal arm, as well as acts, acts for the guide as the, for the vertical motion. Also, the carriage provides low friction surfaces that prevent binding. It consists of three quarter inch rod guides, Delrin line contact surfaces that both promote a low friction operation. So the design of our telescopic arm uh, features a large outer tube and a slightly smaller inner tube. And we were able to uh, utilize a Delrin plastic to fill the gaps between those tubes to ensure a tight fit and a low coefficient of friction for easy sliding for the actuator. And uh, we used a 12 volt, 400 pound, 30 inch stroke linear actuator. And it's positioned inside the two tubes connected at the one end, the hook end of the smaller tube and then the opened end of the larger tube. And it, uh, you can go to the next one. So then for the analysis of the arm, the main calculations to ensure the arm would not fail are shown on the slide. Um, and the rod, the red patch on the image shows the, like a stress patch on the outer surface of the tube where maximum stresses would occur. And the first stress to consider is a torsional stress from the tube on the end of the arm. And that was calculated to be about 2000 PSI. And then the second stress to consider was a bending stress since it's a uh, pulled out 12 inches from that po mounting point. And that was calculated to be about 1300 PSI. And then utilizing more circle to get a normal stress, it was, we were able to calculate, uh, use that normal stress to calculate a factor safety of about 13.7. So the arm is not gonna fail um, due to any of those stresses provided from the largest tube and then uh, the angular and linear deflection is something to consider since we want it to be accurate whenever they're trying to line up the tube and you don't want it to be bouncing around. So it was less than, I mean, it was a, yeah, less than a 10th of an inch on the linear deflection at the end, which should ensure that the tube doesn't bounce around. Shown here are renderings of our connection mechanism. On the left is the hook, which is bolted to that telescopic arm. And on the right is the attachment component, which is bolted to existing points on the bagger tubes. The attachment slides into the hook and a slot in the hook prevents rotation of the bagger tube. 
Here's some engineering analysis of the hook. A large moment is present in what we'll call the throat of the hook, which is boxed in yellow on the left. We determined a quarter inch fillet weld with an E60 electrode will prevent shear and provide safety. Uh, equations on the right show in final production of the lift, quarter inch stainless steel plate will support that moment on the throat as well. And both analysis showed a factor of safety in excess of 10. Um, the large tube attachment shown on the right will take advantage of existing bolt arrangement that are called out on the large frame bagger tube that's on the left. The removable design allows for a low cost and simple replacement if needed. So similar to the previous attachment, the small attachment is shown on the right and is designed around existing bolts and it's simple to fabricate and easily replaceable. Both of the attachments are made of welded quarter inch steel plate and a three quarter inch steel rod. So in choosing an acceptable sheave and wire rope, we needed to conserve vertical space and provide enough strength. We determined a quarter inch six by 19 stainless steel hoisting rope over a four inch sheave would provide that adequate lifespan in the wire rope. The sheave assures 30,000 bend lifespan with a factor of safety of 2.3, and then this would provide a minimum of three years of use. According to ASTM, the factor of safety in the wire rope is 26.9, American Steel and Wire Rope Company Handbook shows a factor of safety of 5.49, and Shigley's Mechanical Engineering Design Textbook gave us a factor of safety of 22.5 for static loading. During our initial demonstration in February, we noted that the winch and actuator were fully functional. The hook attachment fit properly and held the tube, and the lift was easily maneuverable through the facility. We also encountered issues while the lift did while the lift did fit uh, with the machine. It had minimal clearance and proved difficult to position. There were also issues with the carriage binding while lowering the tube. So here's some of our prototype improvements. Throughout testing, our main issue we had to overcome was binding of the carriage. So to overcome this, we first started by adding bearings to the, uh, to the main contact surfaces. This gave a slight improvement with the binding issue, but the main fix was the utilization of a dual drum winch. After this implementation, the carriage traveled smoothly regardless of the load applied. As you can see, the dual drum, the, the dual drum winch is at the bottom right and the, uh, <clears throat> the bearings are located on the top right. Here's a demonstration of our final prototype. We can see that the linear actuator smoothly carries out the uh, horizontal motion for a total of 21 inches out and back in. And this is about the motion we expected to run inside the plant. Now we can see the lift's utilization of the dual cable system to lower and then raise the tube to the proper heights. These are our recommendations for future reproduction of the lift. We recommend installing an AC-DC converter so that the lift can operate if the battery has been allowed to die. There should also be a Delrin plastic on the carriage to reduce friction and allow for easier motion. We also recommend using a dual drum winch rather than modifying a single as we had done. And finally, using a 24 inch actuator rather than the 30 inch, inch one that we use would allow for easier placement into the machine. The production uh, budget presented here is a significant increase over our prototype budget of $2,650. Uh, this because the final production requires stainless steel parts and fasteners 
corrosion resistant battery, a corrosion resistant driving motor, and the fabrication will need to be outsourced. So the total final cost of production will be $7,900. By using this lift, plants can see increased safety and decreased downtime. With a broader implement implementation of our lift, workers can expect higher safety standards while employers get greater efficiency. I want to thank you all for your time and if you all have any questions. Thank you speakers for that presentation. Um, we will open the floor for questions, so you may either use the chat to ask a question. Um, so we got a few here. Uh, Kirk, you had one initially. Um, do you want to ask it again? Let me go ahead and unmute you. There we go. There hey, go. Thank you, guys. Uh, appreciate you presenting to us today. Good job. Um, just a, a question about the wire rope. Did you have any concerns about transfer of, uh, say, wire fibers to the food or you know to the to the package uh with this do you consider any alternatives to using a wire rope that might produce less you know foreign object debris thanks uh, thank you yeah. for that question so yeah. initially we had looked into different drive mechanisms um before we decided on the wire rope but we did choose that the wench would be the best alternative and we do recommend that the wench is regularly inspected, actually weekly, and it's replaced after its lifespan. Okay. We have another question here from uh, Mr. David Craig. Uh, let's see here. David, you're oh, sorry. I, I looked away. I'm sorry, Dr. Reese. Uh, I thought you were going to ask the question for me, but uh, guys, again, good job. Uh, thanks for being here this afternoon under difficult circumstances um, or different circumstances. Mm -hmm. But uh, my question would be, is the plant actually using or planning to implement the use of the lift? Um, they had told us that it's a possibility. Uh, now they're most likely, they'll, well, they'll have to redesign it and create a new one because ours is made out of carbon steel, whereas they, they can, wouldn't okay. be able to use that in the plant, um, right. but they have told us they would look into using the design and implementing it and not only their plant, but multiple different Lamb Wesson plants. Awesome. Good job. Thanks. Yep. Thank you for your question. You mentioned that most of the workers don't even use the current lift. So what are they doing? They just sort of man hauling it up to the thing and lifting it up or? Yeah. Some of them use like a ladder. I mean, a stair, like it's a rollable stairs that they have. And they'll roll it next to the machine and they'll manually put it in using their hands. Um, Does the, the plant have a particular history with um, safety problems? You mentioned the, the pinch points and all that. Uh, Joe, you want to take that? Uh, not that we know of. We know they were concerned about it, but we haven't, uh, they haven't given us records on that. We got a question here from Miss Leslie McKeever. Hey guys, again. thank you. Um, so I'm also interested in the pitch, pinch points and what we did to either prevent those or cover those up for the workers. Joe, you got that one also? Yes, sir. So thank you for your question. So along with, so we did put um, plastic coverings on many of the pinch points at the top and the the bottom so to kind of prevent hands from getting in the way of the carriage and also with this design it it's completely operated from from behind the lift assembly so it's completely operated from a switchboard that's um, not between the operator and the bagger tube so they won't need to get between those and sort of risk those pinch points as well as the coverings that we also have added in spec We have a quick comment here from the plant sponsor, uh, Derek Newman. Derek, you're free to speak. Uh, hey, th yeah, this is the Dale High Group. This is Randall Beasy, uh, the engineering manager here. And we just wanted to, you know, congratulate the group here on, on what they've accomplished, uh, you know, considering what we laid out for them. 
I think they hit it, hit, hit the nail on the head with pretty much everything. You know, the the y'all saw a little bit of the struggle that we have changing these bagger tubes out, and yeah, majority of the people out there on the floor find that machine that we have right now cumbersome, so they don't use it. So they, you know, have to physically lift that bagger tube in to our baggers, which, you know, as you can see, could, you know, is a safety hazard or a safety risk for us, especially around, uh, you know, having to lift overhead and also pinch points. And also, it was mentioned in their presentation, but as the plastic that makes up the bags rub that tube, it creates a lot of sharp uh, sharp points on, on that bag or two, which, you know, we've experienced first aid cases uh, uh, with uh, with cut cut hands. So, you know, the main purpose of this, uh, this project was to come up with a better way, a safer way, really, that people could use and wanted to use, because if it's too cumbersome, they're just not going to use it. So, but I think they achieved their goal of... Uh, Making a machine that you know is easily easy to use and is safe to use, and uh, you know which was priority number one for this project. But another benefit of this project is the faster we can change out those tubes, and we have five baggers, so the faster we can change out those tubes, the faster we can get back to running production, which uh, you know means more French fries made for us over a year's time, and of course more profit. So that's that's what it's about. But uh, yeah, just to recap, you know, the group was great to work with, you know, uh, and they took our uh, comments and suggestions, and uh, you know, they ran with it, and I think they were very successful in the, in their final uh, final what they produced at at the at the end. But will we use this? Yes, we're planning on getting this to the plant Monday. And, you know, we're going to put it out there on the floor and uh, we're going to, you know, see how it actually performs in a machine. And then, you know, based on that, uh, you know, we hope to, you know, produce our own version of, of the prototype and, and share it with all our uh, other plants. So, you know, I think, like I said, everything was achieved and we appreciate them and the time they, uh, they gave us. Thank you, Derek. Are there any more questions? So again, you may put them in the chat. You can flag me down in the chat as well if you'd like to ask a question. I have one more question from Ms. Leslie. Okay. Last question. The Delrin that y'all's group recommended to actually incorporate in the channels of your machine, did you do, do you know the life cycle of those or how easy that is to replace over time? So our, we were planning on ha having um, like a screwed in and so that'd be easily to replace, but we never did anything for the calculations mainly because nothing's moving really fast. So it shouldn't wear out too quickly, but that is something we should look into for recommendations and maintenance and stuff. I have one more question, gentlemen. Um, you had mentioned as part of one of your criteria is to prevent, you know, or minimize the number of crevices for food particles to get trapped in. Um, I did see a couple of box beams. I'm assuming they were all capped, but did y'all check for all that during your final prototype? Yeah, Colin, you want to take that? Yeah, so you, are, are you talking about the open ends on the channel? Yeah, so from your, your SolidWorks designs, it looks like there's some open box beams. I'm not sure if y'all just tap them in the illustration or yes sir absolutely so it was actually in our plans whenever we had access to a full machine shop we had all of the uh, end caps cut out um but whenever whenever we lost access to the machine shop we kind of lost basically lost contact with the caps and it kind of got put on the back burner uh it's it's absolutely something that should be considered in the final design um and i i believe uh yeah, I, I believe that's something we should absolutely consider in the in the final design. And any more questions from our audience? All 
All right, students, uh, thank you so much again for your presentation. We'll go ahead and get the next group ready. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So again, our next student groups, for all of our students who are presenting, please make sure your first and last name is in your profile so I can quickly find you and make you co-host for our next session. So again, for those who are just coming in, um, this is the Mechanical Engineering Senior Design Conference. This is the safety, safety session. And we are about to start our third presentation in about uh, four minutes. Let's start exactly on time. You've been doing very well on time. Thank you again to our two groups that presented so far uh, for staying within those time limits so that we would keep on track. After this presentation, there will be a short 30 minute break to allow everyone to sort of get up and stretch. At that point, I will um, unmute everyone. Uh, you are welcome to remain unmuted and speak to anyone else in the room, or you may mute yourself and uh, you know, do whatever you want in the next 30 minutes during our break, go to the restroom, stretch, uh, do whatever you need to do, get a snack. And again, if you did come in late, there is a copy of the senior design program. I will put a, a link here in the chat. And so if you would like to go and see, read up on the abstracts, uh, and find out more information about the student names, uh, their project sponsors, as well as their advisor, uh, all of that is in the program. Hope everyone's doing well on this Friday. Thankfully, the, the weather here in Ruston is a lot nicer than it was uh, this morning. We haven't had any technical difficulties. Hopefully, we'll remain that way for the remainder of our presentations. Just a reminder to our advisory board um, committee members, um, hopefully you were, you received instruction from uh, Dr. Henry Cardenas uh, about sort of note taking uh, and grading for these presentations. So hopefully you've been keeping track of that. All right, we'll go ahead and get our next group up and ready. So our next group is the ergonomic panel grinder, uh, Cash and Colby. So y'all are currently serving as co-hosts and you are unmuted. Okay, so again, for the audience, if you have questions, you may put it in the chat. Um, and I will, um, you can either ask, to make a request to ask a question at the end, or I can ask it on your behalf. If you'd like me to ask it on your behalf, you just say that in the chat and I will do so. so. All right, gentlemen, whenever you're ready, you may go ahead and start presenting. Thank you, Dr. Reese. So we are, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Colby Rabicki. And I'm Cash Key. And we are the ergonomic panel grinder design team. So we'll begin today by giving a brief overview of our sponsor company, AJ Weller Corporation. We'll then describe the current setup of the system, the problems with it, and our solutions to those problems. The A.J. Weller Corporation creates and supplies custom equipment fabrication and composite materials. 
company's aim is to extend the operational service life of heavy industrial processing facilities. Shreveport branch of AJ Weller Corporation, the one sponsoring us, specializes in the fabrication of steel panels. During fabrication, a heavy handheld grinder is used to remove burrs and weld debris that have formed on the steel panels. Josh? The heavy grinder used to remove weld debris needs to be operated for extended periods of time, so it is currently attached to a lift assisting boom via a retractable cable. The cable exerts a continuous upward force on the grinder, which reduces the effort required by the operator to lift the grinder. A trolley runs along the length of the boom so the operator can reposition the grinder when necessary. Additionally, the boom pivots on the support beam, allowing for a wide range of operator movement. Josh? Here's a closer look at the trolley and lift cable system. The cable attaches to an eye bolt on the grinder. The grinder's power cable is not shown here, but it also runs alongside the lifting cable. I'm going to throw it over to Cash. All right, so the first problem involves the location of the cable's attachment to the grinder. Because the cable is not in line with the grinder's center of gravity, the cable produces a torque on the grinder. The cable's torque acts against the operator as they twist and angle the grinder, causing extra strain on the operator. Next is a visual of unwanted torque that is produced. Here we have a free body diagram of the grinder and the force acting on it. On the left, we have the grinder when it's parallel with the ground. On the right, we have the grinder when it's angled. When the grinder is angled, the cable's lifting force produces a torque that attempts to right the grinder. The cable's torque acts against the worker's torque, causing additional strain on the worker. The next diagram will present a solution for this problem. Our new collar attachment ensures the cable will remain above the grinder center of gravity, thereby producing uh, reducing the counter torque. The cable will slide along the collar as the operator angles the grinder or rotates in this case. By creating a collar that wraps around half of the grinder, it allows the force from the cable to reside directly above the grinder's center of gravity while in operation. In a perfect world, this would eliminate all work for the operator, well, besides lifting the weight of the grinder and, the, and repositioning the boom. But the cable attachment must overcome static and kinetic friction as it moves along the collar. Here is a uh, design consideration that we had. This is a horseshoe collar. It has this track and uh, a rolling trolley that goes in between it, which makes it to where it negates a lot of friction, but it also makes it pesky to maintain because just a lot of dust will get uh, put in the nooks and crannies and stow up the wheels. Um, and it's also not above the center of gravity because it would only have one spot to be mounted right above where the eye bolt was put into in the original attachment. So this is the assembly of the static collar mount along with an exploded view of it. This is our final design and our final concept that we came up with. Other things that were taken into consideration were being able to have the handle fit in any mounting holes through the bracket to ensure if anyone preferred to have it on the left hand that they could. Now that the conceptualization, conceptualization is over, how about we figure out how to break this thing? So doing a couple of force over area analysis or trying to figure out shear stress, um, keep in mind that we're using a 200 pound force. This is a force that's way above uh, the operating um, cases that it will ever go to. So our, on the low end, we have a factor of safety of 46.6. A normal factor of safety would be around, say, three or four being conservative. Uh, sometimes higher company or companies like um, making things, say, at 11 uh, factor of safety. But in this case, we'll go with 46.6. Why not? Uh, the steel rod is made out of 1144 carbon steel, and the aluminum it is made out of 5052 aluminum. Uh, aluminum to reduce the weight and the carbon steel to ensure that our collar will not, not break under any condition. Another mode of failure to analyze is the bending fatigue. 
uh, keep in, uh, think about this. Having a paperclip, you're able to bend the paperclip back and forth, and over after a while, you're able to break the paperclip. Well, say you wanted to break another portion of that paperclip, and it gets smaller and smaller. The smaller it gets, the harder it is to bend, which means that it's harder to break. In this case, the bending fatigue that's going on here, imagine this as a very large paperclip and a very short portion of that large paperclip. This thing will not break. So say we put this 200 pound force down on this um, or up on this collar, we can do a total of 2,543 um, repetitions of this force going down without having to worry about it breaking, which also gets us to the point to where we don't have to do any maintenance on this thing as well. All right, so I'll hand it over to Colby. So our first problem had to deal with the torque produced on the grinder. Uh, our second problem is with the system. Our second problem with the system is the sheer size of the boom itself. It's 26 feet long and weighs 200 pounds, making it difficult for the operator to reposition. Plus, it's difficult to stop the moving boom due to its large momentum. We'll get into the analysis in the next few slides, but let's first establish the variables we'll be using. L is the length of the boom, F is the total applied force, F theta is the rotational force component, P1 is the initial position of the boom at rest, P2 is the new position of the operator as he moves, and beta is the angle of the applied force, and H is the angular momentum. Gosh. Note that while the operator may tug on the boom at any direction they wish, only force applied in the theta direction will contribute to actually rotating the boom. Force in the z direction will try to bend the boom up and down, and force in the r direction will try to stretch the boom. Dash. So we used a position change of three feet and one half second to simulate realistic movement by the operator as they reposition the boom. At its current length of 26 feet, the boom carries an angular momentum of 324 foot second pounds when moving three feet in one half second. The high momentum causes the boom to swing past the operator's new location. As the boom moves past the operator, the cable tugs on the grinder, causing a safety hazard. The largest steel panels that the grinder is used on are 2,000 square inches, or seven feet wide by seven feet long. But having a 26 foot long boom is a bit of an overkill. If we reduce the boom's length from 26 feet to five feet, we can reduce the angular momentum to just four foot second pounds. A lower angular momentum means that the boom will not swing as far past the operator as they adjust their position. And a low angular momentum will also prevent the cable from tugging on the operator as they work. Dash. Here we examine the total input force required by the operator to move the boom. Once again, we're looking at a position change of three feet and one half second. At its current length of 26 feet, the operator needs to apply 25 pounds of force in the theta direction to move the boom. As less and less of the input force is applied in the theta direction, i.e. as the angle beta increases, the force required to move, move the boom increases exponentially. At an angle of 80 degrees, the required input force raises to 144 pounds to rotate the boom. If the length of the boom were reduced from 26 feet to 5 feet, the operator would only need to apply about five pounds of force in the theta direction to rotate the boom. At an angle of 80 degrees, the required input force only rises to 28 pounds. Of course, if the operator were to apply their force at an angle of 90 or 180 degrees, the boom would not rotate at all because none of the force would be applied in the theta direction. Gosh. So a couple of key notes to take from this would be that the new collar attachment uh, will reduce the torque required to rotate the grinder by 55%. And it actually goes up whenever you get into the kinetic side of things as well. It gets around 70, 75%, which is not bad, but it, let's look at the lower amounts as well. The collar is rated to a stand 2,543 cycles, as I stated previously, which should ensure that we will not have to replace this as long as it, it have to go through a lot of things. Um, and also the boom length can be reduced to minimize the force required to adjust its position. Any questions?
Hello. Uh, Reese, you're muted. Dr. Reese. Bad. Thank you. Thank you again, guys. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Again, you may uh, you know, put in the chat if you have a specific question or you'd like me to unmute you uh, to ask your question. Um, so we got to, Kirk, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Okay, great. Thanks. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for uh, presenting to us today. Uh, glad, to, glad to have you. Glad to see what you, you've done. Um, what's the feedback that you've gotten from, uh, from Weller? Are they happy with what you've done? Have you, have you uh, got any feedback from those guys? We have not been in contact with them very much. We've been a little bit uh, extremely busy, but um, we feel like they will be um, glad with what we have came up with as opposed to um, the things that we had going on beforehand. To add on what, to what Cash has said, uh, we know that they didn't want to make any changes to the boom itself, the large 26-foot-long uh, boom, because it would require them to take it down and uh, uh, do a lot of uh, physical maintenance support. So we were focusing more on, uh, they, they would like us to focus more on the grinder itself and the attachment. What about uh, the economics of this? Uh, what, what were your considerations there? What are your thoughts? What's your conclusion there uh, as far as dollar spent? The price, the total price to build the replica or the prototype was only about, I think, $300 cash. Is that correct? Okay. So $340 for the uh, brackets and then say $5 for the metal. And of course you have bolts. So it comes out to about a, a solid $500. But um, fortunately we were able to get in touch with a uh, manufacturing shop and they were extremely, extremely um, happy to work with us. And we were actually donated that um, those two bracket parts for the project. So the, the cost of the project itself has been reduced dramatically to where we may be seeing around, say, a three hundred dollar um, price in the end. Okay. And, I, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm jumping back and forth here. Did, did Weller give you a target on what your your price should be? Um, they gave us a budget of thirteen hundred dollars, I believe. Okay. Okay. So. I'll go ahead and actually, uh, we got AJ Weller on the line, so I'm gonna let them speak. Mr. Frank. Mr. Frank, um, even unmuted. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I, I worked with um, the guys a bit for this project. Um, and like they said, um, right now, we, we don't have any plans to change the, the boom. Um, so we kind of told them to restrict um, their designs or the changes they're gonna to make to the grinder itself. Um, but the, some of the questions I have, because I've not seen this design, but some of the questions I have is, um, the handle, is it gonna go through, um, is it gonna go through the what you guys fabricate? Because I see there are holes on the sides. Um, yes, the sir. handle, yeah, it's, it's gonna go through it. Yes, sir. Now, yes, do, you sir. Know how, do you know how long the bolt, um, on the handle is to be sure that it's going to go through and screw in enough in order for it to get a grip. Uh, uh, yes, sir. I was actually doing a lot of hands-on with it, and the uh, the thread for the the on the handle is it's not very accurate, and and the threads themselves going into it, it's more of a friction fit. So okay. uh, whenever it's actually screwed in, it's honestly using about two threads uh, effectively. And uh, once the bracket's put on, it's it's able to it's able to grab definitely more than five or six threads itself. So and to add on, yeah. and to add on to what Cash was saying, we were thinking about if it wasn't uh, threaded enough, then we could create our own handle. I don't think it would be too difficult to uh, thread a steel rod and uh, make it as long as we need to. Put some grip tape on it. But luckily, we we haven't had to come into that issue everything has been put together and it's working uh, just fine we just have to do a few more tests with it it uh, 
just got put together a couple of days ago and we are trying to get everything done as soon as possible before the quarter's over. The, the second question I have is, um, how was the plan? How do you guys, what do you guys have in mind to attach um, the cable to the hoop? So the cable right now uses the, um, not a C clamp, but um, Cash, would you go, would you go back to the- uh, It's sort of a, it's, there we go. All right, so we could use that same attachment right there, the, uh, the little U clamp uh, to attach it onto uh, the, the collar itself. Uh, it, it would be pretty easy to, to move that along the, uh, the collar of the boom. Uh, as you angled it. Uh, there's also, uh, to reduce friction, we've considered some other materials to use as well as some other, uh, some other attachments. Yes, okay. And um, to recap on that as well, the uh, static coefficient or the 55% to 75% work reduction that was put into that, the uh, friction of that hook and uh, the steel collar that we're going to be using has been factored into that to show that we have a, we actually have a reduction of work for the workers. Okay. Well, anyway, I look to um, getting to lay my hands on it. Um, so far, I think it's good. Um, yes, sir. I like the fact that it is simple and um, you don't have uh, much moving parts. No, I, I actually, uh, I have a picture, or I have it sitting right next to me right now, if you want to see it. It's show and tell for everybody. I, I, I would like to see. I would like to see it in person. You don't have right. to show. It. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Oh, right. well, thank you guys. Thank you, yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Frank. Yeah. I think we got another question here. Um, David, do you still have a question? No, I I, I think the guys answered it. Um, you know, while they were uh, while they were answering the previous questions, um, it sounds like it may get implemented. Um, in in uh, in some manner, so oh, that's no, that's it, good. It will for sure. Got another question here from uh, Sam Witzel. Um, he asked, "How many cycles does the grinder undergo in a normal week of work?" Um, so that's and that's kind of hard to gauge. Uh, assuming that the the guys work on these every day, uh, constant usage. Um, they're they're gonna go quite quite a few few cycles over that, but uh, the the logic behind the uh, calculations were if we put it at 200 pound force, the uh, the only way to really get a 200 pound force on the collar would be to take the whole grinder and intentionally slam it down onto the ground as hard as you, or not onto the ground but just slam it down as hard as you could. And right. um, the force from the uh, spring spool would be the deciding factor on whether it meet that 200 pounds or not. So to reiterate, the 2,543 cycles were based on a 200 pound force on the uh, on the collar attachment, which is unlikely to ever um, um, uh, input that much force on the attachment. Uh, the grinder itself only weighs about 12 and a half pounds, and the upward force of the cable that exerts on it is another. 10 pounds. So we're only looking at about 30 pounds, but we used a 200 just to be conservative and, and see how, how much force we could put on this thing uh, and how often before it broke. Well, I'm thinking of a worst case scenario if a worker has it um, and let's say they slip off of the, the steel plate that they're working on and their whole body weight falls on this. Mm -hmm. that, that could easily exceed 200 pounds. That's a good point. Uh, we did not, uh, run any calculations for uh, like a large mass falling on it. Uh, something to consider in the future, absolutely. Yeah. We have any other questions from the audience? Again, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat and either I can ask it on your behalf or I can unmute you. Um, I think I have one more question if anyone still writing a question here. Um, can you go Forward a couple of slides, you were showing sort of the different alternative designs and stuff. So with this collar here, uh, not the horseshoe, but the original collar that you actually used. Okay. okay. Um, so that, that collar, just does it just snap into those brackets or is it welded in there or what, how does that all work? Okay, so um, originally the, 
you see a, a couple of these up here on the top left. Uh, that was the original bracket. We originally had it to where we would just put a set screw through there and have it just friction fit. But that that became a problem because we wanted to use aluminum for the brackets and being able to put a bunch of force on a small set screw to hold in a steel rod was just just wasn't ideal. And uh, talking with the fab shop guy, obviously he has a lot more experience than I do. And uh, he just shot off the bat, hey, why don't you thread them instead is, instead of doing these um, set screws. So on both ends, uh, they're threaded and the brackets are screwed onto the collar and then uh, the collar with the brackets is slid onto the grinder and the bolts are put into it with a handle. And everything lines up when it's done that way. Yes, sir. Okay. And and no loose threads or anything either. It's, it was it was bittersweet whenever it happened. Okay. Do you have any other questions from the audience? Okay, well, speakers, thank you so much for your presentation. Sorry, thank you guys. Thank you. So at this point, um, ladies and gentlemen, we are now at our 30 minute break. It's actually gonna be a little bit longer than 30 minutes, gonna be about 39 minutes. Our next presentation will not be until 3.30. That will be the satellite threat neutralization project. Um, so what I will do in the meantime then is I'm going to unmute everyone. Uh, you are free to talk with each other if you would like. Uh, if you do not want to, you may mute yourself. Okay, I do want to remind everyone that this is recording still, um, so please be careful of what you say on your computer screen. Again, if you would like to mute yourself, you might, you may do that. I will also uh, enable chat, so, so you may publicly chat with people, you may send private messages to someone that you see in the audience here. Um, but we will start again, I will meet up again around three, uh, 25, our next group, the Satellite Threat Neutralization Group, stand by. Uh, we will get you up and ready at around 325. Again, welcome to everyone. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces. I see uh, well, also I a lot of... Why is there? I see a lot of uh, uh -huh. names here. So we got a lot of family members. So welcome to family. Thank you again. Ellen is something is flashing on with Ellen's girl picture that said you were on in box. Yeah. I, I, I thought I had turned the video on. Uh, this is Taylor. Hello. Have there been any problems with the presentation so far? Is everyone being able to hear them correctly? And uh, they're everyone speaking up. I've been able to hear this, the students, uh, so I'm hoping you're able to hear them too. Ted, I muted you. David, did you have a, a question or a comment? I was just going to tell you, you had the group muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, <laughs> I'm trying to unmute. So if you mute yourself, I have to unmute you again. Um, so. Okay. I apologize for the way it's set up. It, it's it's to prevent any background noise. Um, a lot of y'all are still at home or maybe in your office. I know there's a lot of distractions. Um, I even had to leave my house, so there would be no distractions during the presentations. Um, so, but it seems like so far everything's been going real well. Also a reminder, there's the 
uh, awards for the mechanical engineering senior design projects. That will be after our last presentation, um, actually about an hour after, or 30 minutes after that one uh, at five o'clock. There is a Zoom link on the conference webpage to get to that. So it's in a different uh, Zoom room. So, uh, so again, immediately after our last presentation, which will start at four o'clock uh, and end around 4.30, there's about a 30 minute window there before the award session happens. And that's in a separate Zoom session hosted by Dr. Henry Cardenas. Again, if you just came in to the Zoom session, this is the mechanical engineering conference or senior design conference for the safety session. I have pasted a link here and I'm going to continue doing that for every 40 minutes or every hour. Um, if you'd like to see the program of all of our senior design teams uh, for all of our majors, not, not just the mechanical engineers, but everyone here at Tech, uh, there's the abstracts, the names of our seniors, as well as their sponsors and advisor information. So I, I encourage you to go through and see all the great work our students have been doing. Uh, especially given this really challenging time, they've done a, a really good job overcoming the struggles of having to sort of meet remotely. Uh, we've already heard from a couple of groups some of the challenges of being denied services or materials due to closing of certain welding shops. Um, so they've they've made up made do with what they can, and they've done a really good job doing that. So again, for those, if you're just, just um, tuning in here, during the questions, you can put something in the chat. You can also raise your hand if you know how to do that. Uh, if you're interested, you can go to participants and uh, you'll see a list of everyone who's present in the room. And there should be a little button that says raise hand. If you do that, I will see that. And uh, during the Q&A part, I can unmute you and you can answer a question or you can write your question in the chat and I can either ask it on your behalf or I can unmute you, okay? Chester, did you have a question or? Yeah, I had typed some questions for each of the presentations and I must have just gotten lost in your, in your I'm sure, wall of text that you're getting. I actually do not have any record of those questions. <laughs> it says I was sending them to you privately, which is what I thought maybe Zoom was doing, but it, they weren't crazy earth shattering questions, but they were, uh, some of them were built on some of the other questions and stuff, so. <laughs> I apologize for that. That's all right. I just wanted to ask if I was doing something wrong, to, so I'll just use the raise hand feature in the future and we can. Yeah, go do that. the raise hand feature. I will be able to see that and then I can I can call on you. Thank you, sir. Hey, uh, whoever just said that they had some questions, um, uh, ergonomic panel grinder is still here to answer any. Chester, did you have a question for the Yeah, the, the, the one you guys didn't, or uh, I didn't hear anyone else ask kind of was, did you guys do any analysis for how sensitive the improvement that you guys saw with the design was to the plane of design it was in like basically if someone is falling and holds on to it and that gets bent slightly do you see dramatic changes in the forces involved or does it does it stop providing as much uh, support as you guys were claiming pretty quickly if it gets bent out of shape just being in that environment I imagine it's going to see some uh, it's going to end up out of shape pretty quickly um so your assumptions are, are correct um these uh, these grinders do go through quite a bit and um and they they have some wear and tear but um i'm 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 still confident with the numbers and the uh, strength of the steel and uh the length the the length that it's offset from the uh mounts that it, it it's not gonna need any repairs or anything it's 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 a pretty fairly strong strong steel for what it is so that that formed rod is is gonna last as long as the fastener is holding it to the grinder or whatever 
Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the only only other issue it's it's still it's still the same issues. The bending is um, putting putting threads at that point, and um, that that may have reduced it a little bit more. And I'd be uh, more than glad to go back in and do the numbers, and it'd probably reduce it just a little bit since we put the threads in. Oh, I, I know for a fact that it would, but um, it, it was set at that, and it's just by handling it and working with it from what it is now, it's it's still it's still pretty sturdy. Thank you. Yes, sir. Just have the website for gaming. Oh, it's Dr. Reese. Okay. Yeah, let's we'll do that. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm asking. Gaming, but, or the puzzle button back then. Dr. Reese. I think I saw him in there. Like, oh, okay. Alright. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead the uh, the angle of twist equation is a overview. Uh, is a overview of why we couldn't have added a pivot on the boom. Um, did the math and it would actually make the the end of the boom come out or drop down three feet, which is a little too much. Okay, now it's okay. No, that's it. I would tell us. We'll let you know, she said. So I don't know what number this is, but 3.30 is when they... There's Charles and Ann watching. So again, for those who are just signing in, um, welcome to the Mechanical Engineering Senior Design Conference. This is the safety session. Our next presentation will not be until 3.30, so we'll get started around 3.25. In the meantime, um, feel free to chat with people who are currently in the room using the chat. Um, if you, some of y'all are, I, I muted everyone, but some of y'all remuted yourself. If you'd like to be unmuted, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Uh, and you can talk to people in the room or um, if you have additional questions that you just missed, during our first three presentations, you can do that as well. But you can use this time also to stretch, use the restroom, go get a snack. This is what we would have normally been doing if we had been meeting in person. We're gonna to have to talk to Henry about those snacks. Mine hadn't shown up yet. <laughs> We actually thought about it. We thought about sending everyone some uh, trail mix or some, something else in the mail. <laughs> because I did ask the question, what's the point of having a break if, if everyone's already doing this from the comforts of their home or office? That's true. I got my snacks right here next to me. <laughs> I will say one thing. Um, in... 10 years of doing this, uh, I've seen more participants in the chat than I've ever seen in a room. It's been a while since I was able to attend a senior design conference. Um, I'm normally teaching at these hours, but with the new online learning, it freed up a lot of my time. Um, so I was actually really happy to get a chance to moderate the session. Um, I was really impressed reading up on the uh, the abstracts and reading up on some of the uh, the project information. Um, really neat stuff. And again, given the the circumstances that happened uh, this quarter, I, I'm really impressed uh, with what kind of work the students were able to get out. Um, with a lot of businesses closing down, tech essentially closing down our facilities as well. Um, so they didn't have access to the machine shop. So a lot of them, you know, were doing this. They were making do with whatever materials they they can. 
So hopefully everyone in attendance is a little understanding if they, they may have used a slightly inferior material. Um, that wasn't necessarily because they overlooked something. It's probably because they didn't have access to those materials or the fabrication techniques to make everything fit together. So hopefully they'll mention that in their, their presentations. Uh, but if you do have questions, you know, again, do not hesitate to uh, put that in the chat and uh, I'll forward those questions to them. That first presentation, like 59 people in the chat, I mean, in the, in the room. That's all of us and the presenters as well, but still. It's, it's convenient. Even with our new building space, we would have been able to fit more than usual. But um, with this virtual space, I mean, we can fit, I think a Zoom session can fit as much as 100 something uh, people uh, without problems. And as me, for me as a moderator, it's actually really easy for me to control everything too. So it uh, makes my job a little easier as well. Yeah, I have to admit, I was even though I do this all day long, every day at work, I was a little apprehensive of, at how this was going to go, but I think it's gone great so far. Um, and again, if, if you have questions, but also if you if there's a problem with the video or audio feed, um, I've already committed this infraction once, but if you start, if they start talking and they're muted, uh, please let us know in the chat and we will fix that right away. See a lot of parents in the audience. Again, welcome parents. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and getting to sort of see your child's presentation. Um, even if your child's probably presenting in the room next door, um, we're happy for all y'all to be here um, and sort of cheer on your, your student. Again, ask questions uh, to your, your child and their teammates project. And a reminder um, for those, if you know someone who wanted to attend this and they're, they don't have access to Zoom or uh, they just couldn't be free during this time, do note that we are recording this whole session uh, and a link or a file will be available sometime in the future on the college website. So you may go back and see these presentations um, if you missed it for whatever reason, or if you know someone who really wanted to be here to see the presentation, um, you can do that. So again, we'll, we'll start. We'll start up again around three twenty-five. The su students in the audience. Y'all excited about graduating in a couple of weeks? I think all the students went to the snacks. Yeah, Dr. Reese, I was uh, just thinking back. It was probably 20 years ago today for me that I was doing the same thing, so. I had a less than memorable senior design. I'm actually from biomedical engineering and chemical. Oh, engineering. Yeah. So um, my, my senior design experience was not pleasant at all. Um, so I, I do enjoy seeing these projects come together far better than mine did. Right. Um, so it's, it's, again, it's just a pleasant sight to see everything come together, the students working so well. Uh, yeah, ours, was, ours was great. It was with, with Lockheed, but the problem we had was that it was, um, we were all on NDA. And so uh, no one could see it. It was like we presented to uh, a couple of professors, <laughs> no one else, and didn't get to enter the competition or anything. And so we just, eh, nah, all right. Well. Satisfaction and job well done. I mean, that's got to be, that's got to be pretty neat, though. I mean, you're, you're cool. on a pretty top secret project but yeah it is a shame that you can't talk about it today. right right yeah so i guess you do i can't talk had, about that it was it was pretty basic uh, now that i look back at it with what i do now and, um, but it was it was cool we had a we had like an eight person team split in two one did mechanical one did the electrical side and it was it was really cool it was the first time to have a big kind of conglomerate team like that
Gosh, 20 years, I'm old. <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you how long it's been for me. <laughs> we got another one. Hey, Brendan. Hey. Yeah, I was about to say, it's only been about three years for me since I was in their shoes. It's only been a couple of years for you. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we heard that they were going on today right when I got back from work. So me and my roommate both jumped on. He's watching the electrical engineering ones and I'm in here. I'll tell you what, um, the uh, applause to our sponsors that, that came in and, and gave these ideas and sort of the budgets for our students to work with. Um, you know, I, I came from biomedical and chemical. We, we had certain projects, but we didn't have sponsors or uh, these kind of budgets that they're working with. So it's, it's really impressive to see sort of these corporate sponsors get involved. Um, the kinds of projects that we get out of this are just, just amazing, um, you know, when we get corporate sponsors. So, so to our sponsors, thank you so much for, for helping us. We hope to continue doing work with you. We hope that the students, uh, you know, did great work and you're proud of their work and hope that you continue working with us so well I know that that uh, our group gets tired of hearing me say it but I think over the last decade, the quality of the uh, the projects has improved greatly, and I I know that it's you know vastly improved from 1983. I agree with that. Um, I think our, our faculty and staff here do a great job. I think um, with the, our new resources now. Uh, Students have access to a lot of different equipment, uh, different fabrication processes that they can, they can utilize. Uh, the, the, the level that these projects are now being presented on, it's, it's really impressive. Um, I, I served as an advisor for two projects this quarter. Uh, neither one of them are in this, this session. Um, and I was sort of impressed with the, the level of um, sort of the fabrication that had to go all into it. Uh, you know, part of me was actually a little worried. I was sitting there just like, y'all are still students. Y'all don't even have an engineering degree yet, but here we are trusting you with these projects that are going to hopefully become working prototypes. Um, so I've seen a lot of questions in the, the chat here regarding, uh, are these prototypes going to be used by the sponsors? And we've heard directly from some of these sponsors that yes, they will be used. Um, maybe in their original form or with some slight modification. And so that's, you know, great to hear um, that the student's work is not just going to be put to the, the, the side here. It's, it's going to be used. And that's, uh, that's very, very impressive. So we still got another 12 minutes before we will get the next group up and ready. Um, so our, satellite threat neutralization team so make sure you're back on around 325 we'll get set up and we'll start at 330. you just now doing the math Kurt is that what it is? <laughs> what's that? I asked were you just now doing the math? Oh the math on which? On how long it's been since 1983? Oh no 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 no! I'm I'm not. I'm just sitting here working. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, 1983. I won't tell you how old I was. You were about 17, probably. No, I'm kidding. You were five. <laughs> how old was Steve then? 60? Uh, no, my dad would have been 27. Yeah, 27. No, I haven't 20. seen him much oh, no, no, during no. all this. Yeah, something like that. 28, 28, I guess. I haven't seen him much during all this. He's, I think he's been sticking close to the house and probably he right for Yeah, I think it's about to drive him nuts. He's, he's, uh, he's kind of a people person, you know. He likes to be out and see folks. Um, 
this is yeah. it speaks to a little bit of my I have a small amount of introvertedness and I'm enjoying staying home. It's been great. <laughs> <laughs> I made it well, actually I made it a week and then I came up here for a day and then I stayed home for about a week and a half and I've been back ever since. So uh, I save about two and a half hours of travel time every day that I work at home, uh, just given my commute. And uh, yeah, it's been nice to be be here. I, I brought my monitors home. I've got everything I need. It's like, I mean, I got, I don't need it, but I got a 3D printer over here next to me. I got all kinds of toys I can play with, you know, <laughs> if I get bored. <laughs> Yeah, I pretty much got the same setup at home that I do here. So, and it's closer to the coffee pot at my house than it is here. Yeah. So that, um, yeah. that, that helps. Yeah, my commute from from you know bedroom to to office is twenty steps or so. So it's nice. Doctor C, what are you doing lurking in here? <laughs> Unmute Kelly. Dr. Reese. Let's see, let me get him. Kelly in a is he in a, a restaurant? Where, where is he? There, there we go. go. Uh, yeah, that's the first power. thing I want to know is where are you? <laughs> in my shop. Okay. That's a new angle. I haven't seen that angle in your shop yet. Yeah, uh, angle. I guess I changed maybe the where the camera was to yeah, you, you remove the camera settings. That's not the original viewpoint. No, you I think have. I had it higher. Um, I don't know, remember why I did that or if I did it on purpose, might not have even done it on purpose. <laughs> now we got finished with the multidisciplinary ones. So thought I'd come over to some of these rooms and see what was going on. But these all have a break right now. So it's like commercials on television. Everybody's yep. on break at the same time. Who's up next in this one? The Satellite Threat Neutralization Team. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Harden's group. With Luke and Caleb and, and Celeste is in there, I think. Yep. Okay. Yep, and then we have the skitter tire guys. Uh, okay. And then that's it for our presentations. We actually wrap up a little early. Yeah, good. Yep. I think that's my neighbor's group. That Crystal's group. Which one? The Skitter Tire guys. Uh, I want to say she's the advisor on it. Yeah, I think so. Crystal's my neighbor. <laughs> I think we live in the most secure neighborhood in Ruston. <laughs> there's a neighborhood facebook group and apparently we have a bunch of um, retirees that have nothing better to do but look out their front window but i promise you if you drive by through there slowly twice you and your license plate are on facebook <laughs> uh, who are these people and what do they want uh, wow. <laughs> If you stay gone a lot like I do, it's kind of a comforting thought that you know oh, yeah. somebody's out, you know, looking around all the time. Trying to remember, Kelly, which room this is. We we would have been in room one twelve in the new building. Right, y'all were. Wonder... That was the freshman building, freshman classrooms, if I recall correctly. Right? It was the one. Um, it no, it was had circuits in it and basic measurements. Okay, I think because that's that's actually a pretty sizable room. It's a big room. 
Okay, so we would have been able to fit our largest attendance. We had, I think, uh, David said we had 58 at the very beginning. Wow. So <laughs> we, would have, we would have filled the room. So wow. yeah, 58 or 59 for the first presentation. Good deal. And there's a few people. I noticed there's a few people. There's maybe two or three people. Uh, we got some parents and grandparents listening in. So I know there's probably two or three people in front of the screen. So we probably would have actually overfilled the room. Yeah, because it, it has... Um, it fits 60, 61, something like yeah, that. Yeah, somewhere in that range. Uh, I'm pretty sure For it's... For actual the, presentations, I think I've seen 304, 305, whichever one of those rooms is at the end, was at the end of the hall in Bogart. Yep. Full, maybe twice in 10 years. And yeah. only, that only holds about 45 people in there. Right. Um, Kelly, we, we discussed, I think, at a meeting, or maybe it was with Heath, um, that in the future we might look into streaming these sessions online, still do it in person. Right, still do it in person. I, yeah, it, it actually rent, went really well in the ones that I was in earlier. Um, there were more people there than there normally would have been, and just like in here. Yeah. Like a real telethon kind of thing. <laughs> exactly. Just, Maybe we can attach some money to it. Right, right. Call now the donate. Donate now button. <laughs> you can just keep posting that link in the chat, you know, about every <laughs> 10 minutes. Put a PayPal account in there. There you go. Donate <laughs> now. You probably can automate that so it just shows up like every 10 minutes. I don't know. Did y'all have our, questions? That would drive the attendance down, I think. <laughs> yeah, bye. Celeste says it would be helpful for people out of state to see what's going on. Um, I, I agree. I think assuming it's doable, I don't see why not to, to add it in as something. Um, even in our advisory board meetings, we always have at least one person who can't make it here. Um, Absolutely. Be nice to. As an out of state student myself, when I was here, uh, you know, my parents were upset that they didn't get to see it. I was sort of happy they weren't present because I knew my dad would embarrass me, but, uh, you know, I, they they were sort of a little upset that they didn't get to see it. Um, so I, I think something like this would be really neat and helpful. Yeah. Are you in charge of this room, Lewis? Yeah, I'm the moderator okay. for this session. Okay. I see Dr. Corbett. Yep, he has arrived. Hey, Crystal. Hey, everyone. Thought I'd pop in to hear the presentations. <laughs> Your group's of, uh, gonna be up in about an hour, so. Yeah. <laughs> about 30 minutes. Yep. So again, for our next group, uh, the satellite threat neutralization, make sure you're all online. In about two or three minutes, we'll go ahead and, and start switching over the controls to you. Um, but we still got a few more minutes before we get started. Again, um, great job to our speakers so far. Y'all have done a really good job with uh, you know, speaking and handing it off to each other. I know that, and that's difficult to do in person, but I can't imagine the additional difficulties of trying to do that in this setting. Uh, Y'all have done a real good job of handing off you know, speaking responsibilities, uh, making it really smooth transitions. So again, good job to, to all our speakers so far, and I'm sure our next two groups are gonna continue doing that. How have you been doing questions? Uh, we've been doing um, just questions in the chat and I can unmute individuals or I can ask on their behalf. Okay. So far it seems other than, I think we had one case, um, Chester's questions weren't getting through, but uh, <laughs> we, we found a temporary solution for that. So um, I'll try and respond back to help everyone if, if um, if for some reason I keep saying there are any more questions and I'm not acknowledging you, it's probably not showing up in my chat for some reason. If that's the case, please, uh, you know, raise your hand or, you know, if you need to turn on your video feed and just wave frantically, <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know, unmute you. Yeah, I remember we have so many participants, it's actually over a couple pages here. I got to occasionally right. scan all the pages here. 
Right. I haven't figured out a way to get them to all show at once. I, I think you're limited to 25 on a single page. Well, that must be it then. And so if you got more than 25, so we got 34 right now, I have to go back and forth between two pages. I've had a couple of Bring up the participants list and put it on the side. Well, I got you that. Can, you can see most of them. Yeah. Um, but I can't see, I can't see their video feed. So if they're waving to me, trying to get my attention, I can only see 25 people at a time. Yeah. But Chester says it maxes out at 49. If I have the downloaded app, I don't think I'm using the app. I'm using text uh, interface right now. So uh, I knew that might someone said they could go to 49 and I never could figure that part out. It was, yeah, I heard someone say that at our meeting and I was like, I've been limited to 25. Uh, yeah. That might be the difference in the app versus the uh, tech portal. And the browser only allows you to do one window at a time. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get our next speakers ready. So satellite threat neutralization team sounds looks like everyone's here. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over. Um, make y'all co-host here. Make sure I get the right Swafford here. I see the whole Swafford family is here. A couple of trims as well. Okay. All right, so guys, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone and only unmute our speakers that are going to be presenting in a couple minutes. Again, if you have a question, um, you can put it in the chat, uh, and we will answer those questions at the end of the presentation. If you would like me to just ask the question on your behalf because your microphone's not working, uh, just make sure you put that in the chat. Otherwise, I can just unmute you, and uh, we'll call on you uh, in the order that the questions show up in the chat for me. Um, I'm also going to disable the chat to everyone feature, so you can only chat to me. This is just to prevent any kind of distractions uh, for our, our student presenters. We'll make sure we, we start exactly on time in case we have some people coming into the Zoom session. So again, for those who just came in, this is the Mechanical Engineering Senior Design uh, Project Conference. Uh, this is the safety session. We've got two more presentations left in the session. So our first is satellite threat neutralization. And we will start exactly at 3.30. So we got maybe a minute and a half left. So grab your, grab your snacks, grab your drinks, and enjoy our presentation. Uh, Dr. Reese? Yes. I'd just like to verify real quick that I'm actually sharing screen so that everyone can see it. Uh, does everyone see the screen right here? OK, I see a bunch awesome. of thumbs up here. Good. Yes. All right. Thank you. Again, you can ask a question at any time during the presentation, but I won't unmute anyone or I won't ask the question on your behalf until the designated Q&A part of our presentation at the end. Okay, but if you have a question, um, you can put it in the chat. If it's been answered, then you can just say, never mind, I, I withdraw the question, that's fine. All right, so we'll go ahead and introduce our next group. So our next group is Satellite Threat Neutralization. Okay, so Celeste, Luke, Caleb, and, and Katie. Guys, y'all may take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Celeste Ewerts. I'm Luke Hansen. Caleb Swafford. And I'm Catherine Trim. And today we will be doing our final presentation on the neutralization of concentrated energy threats to small satellites. 
Since the very first satellite, Sputnik 1, was launched in 1957, the number of satellites in Earth's orbit has increased dramatically. As of 2019, there were over 2,000 satellites in Earth's, Earth's orbit. Of these 2,000, the U.S. owned about 1,000 of them, which greatly outnumbered the rest of the world, as you can see here on this bar chart. Our large number of satellites in orbit means two things. One, our society is becoming increasingly dependent on these satellites to perform our daily tasks. And two, with this increasing dependence, our satellites are becoming more prone to attack by non-allied nations. One method that is currently being tested to attack satellites is through the use of a directed energy weapon, or DEW. These weapons are capable of incapacitating satellites by induced thermal damage over short periods of time. As weapons like these are being developed, it's important that the U.S. equips their satellites with a defense system. Today, we will be going over three potential designs for a satellite defense system. Our final design choice, its fabrication, as well as the testing of that design. Our project sponsor and advisor was Dr. Arden Moore, who is a mechanical engineering professor, as well as the principal investigator of the Multiscale Energy Transport and Materials Lab at Louisiana Tech University. Dr. Moore funded our project through his NSF Career Award. So before we could start brainstorming ideas for a defense system, we first had to understand what the requirements our system needed to meet were. Our project is a proof of concept sense and respond thermal defense system for small satellites. Dr. Moore also provided us with these following requirements. The system has to be able to withstand an incident heat flux of at least 2.5 watts per centimeter squared over a diameter of 2.5 centimeters for a duration of at least 30 continuous minutes while maintaining a surface temperature below 200 degrees Celsius. After we had a clear understanding of what our system needed to be capable of, we came up with three design concepts and then compared them with the weighted decision matrix that you see here. In this decision matrix, we determined criteria that we felt were important considerations for our design and weighted them according to their level of importance, with five being the most important. These criteria are cost, volume, feasibility, weight, response time, and effectiveness. Our first design concept utilizes a radiator, which um, utilizes a radiator, which uses a working fluid to transfer the thermal energy from the side being attacked by a directed energy weapon to the opposite side that is not having any heat. Our second design concept was one that utilized a reflective surface that once the system sensed the attack, it would move that reflective surface to the location of the attack and it would disperse or redirect the beam from a directed energy weapon away from the satellite. Our third design concept utilizes a phase change material or PCM, which is a substance that is able to absorb a lot of thermal energy while it is undergoing a phase change. And so this system would also sense the attack and then move that unit to the location of the attack where it would stay for the duration of the attack, absorb that energy, and then once the threat is passed, it would move the unit away from the attack and disperse the energy elsewhere. So once we had our three designs, we went back to our decision matrix and scored each of these respectively. As you can see, external reflection scored a total of 43, while the radiator scored 60, and the phase change scored 67. So ultimately, we decided to go with the phase change concept. All right, so our project has three main components. We have our phase change absorption module, heat absorption module, our sensor response system controls, and our satellite wall. Here is our phase change module in an exploded view. All right, so as you can see here, here is our built uh, phase change module, and then there's a cross-sectional model of our SOLIDWORKS model. 
So there's, it was made up of several different components. We're gonna start with the front plate. The front plate was made with the same material as the satellite wall. So that thermally the satellite wall and the front plate are the same for consistent heat transfer. We made it a square profile. So this allows the module to function on the entire satellite wall surface. The PCM we chose was paraffin wax. It was chosen because it's very inexpensive and it performs well under cyclic thermal loading. Other uh, PCMs that were considered were hydrated salts, but those are extremely corrosive, so that didn't fit our needs. For the back plate, we used the same material as the front plate for consistency, and we chose a round profile for convenience when filling the module with the PCM. We have threaded rod that runs through the module to retain structural rigidity in the axial direction, and it's threaded into the front plate and secured through the back plate with nuts and those are sealed with O-rings. Uh, around the module, we have a neoprene bladder and this allows for a volume change of the PCM without damaging the structure because the PCM will be melting and solidifying many times throughout, this, um, throughout its uh, functionality. And it is attached with, to the front plate with clamps and to the back plate with a hose clamp. The bracket mates the linear actuator with the PCM module, and this is fabricated using additive manufacturing. It's attached to the PCM module by threaded rods and is bolted to the linear actuator. So what you see here is our satellite wall with the thermocouples installed in it. The satellite wall is milled from 6061 aluminum. This is a standard aerospace aluminum. We chose a CubeSat form factor and we scaled it up to fit our needs. It's composed of two plates. Only the bottom plate is shown here uh, and it sandwiches the thermocouples between it. Uh, the second plate that isn't shown is significantly thinner to this plate. The channels are milled into the surface of the thicker plate so that the thermocouples can run through those and maintain a flat profile for the back of the satellite wall. And we had a thermal paste that was spread between the two satellite plates to ensure consistent heat transfer. The thermocouples we selected are K-type and the tips were secured to the satellite wall using RTV silicon. And due to the size of the wall, we chose a three by three centered grid. All right, here's our sense and respond circuit. So as you can see, there's our satellite wall. When the directed energy weapon hits the wall, the thermocouples sense a change in temperature. And from there, they send a single that signal that goes through the amplifier into our microcontroller. We selected an Arduino Mega. This is where the location of the attack is interpolated. And from there, stepper motors move the PCM module into position under the satellite wall and then deploys the linear actuator to mate with the rear of the satellite wall to absorb the energy. Uh, here you can see our plotter. We chose a prefabricated plotter and we modified it to fit our needs. As you can see here, that is how the phase change module is attached to the plotter and you can also see the positions of our stepper motors. So here's our fun final assembly all put together. All right, so the final assembly, we, we used a desktop computer frame to mount our assembly in and the plotter is actually bolted to that black frame using L bolts. Um, from there, you can see how our satellite wall is supported by the uh, four corner posts and the satellite wall is actually embedded in a sheet of acrylic. This allowed us to have a smaller uh, satellite face. So we could focus on the proof of concept and we used a engineered adhesive to secure the satellite wall and the acrylic. The R design can be scaled up or down depending on the needs of the satellite, but we chose this specific size just for our proof of concept. <laughs> So uh, in order to kind of assess some of the strengths and weaknesses of various components of our satellite that were critical to functionality, we performed several different analyses that were a mixture of pan calculations and simulations. The first of these was a uh, calculation of the volume that we would need of paraffin wax in order to absorb all of the energy entering our system. 
you kind of see a flow chart of our process here so that we don't have a bunch of equations uh, on the screen that are hard to in interpret. Uh, so our basic process for this, this calculation was we took the initial conditions, uh, namely the, the heat flux uh, that we were given and the duration of the attack, which is 30 minutes, and use that to calculate the uh, thermal energy uh, that would be entering our system. Next, we used that in addition to the latent heat of fusion of paraffin wax to calculate the mass that we would need. And the latent heat of fusion basically just describes the energy per mass that is required to change the phase of a material. From there, we calculated the energy that would only go into changing the phase of the material and not changing the temperature of the material and use that to adjust our overall phase change attack energy. Um, then we adjusted our mass according to our adjusted energy and from there gathered our required volume. And in addition, we applied a factor of safety of 1.25 to our final volume uh, so that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this, the, this factor of safety came from a study that we did on the uh, typical factors of safety in aerospace applications similar to this one. The next uh, analysis that we ran was a thermal analysis uh, on the PCM itself. And this was to show us that the phase uh, change material would behave like we expected, that the heat front would advance through it and it wouldn't all just stay up at the front of our module. We, in this simulation in SOLIDWORKS, um, we go back, yeah, there we go. Uh, we ran the simulation in SOLIDWORKS. We weren't able to perform this calculation by hand because um, that kind of 3D transient analysis incre is incredibly complex and very iterative, so it'd be very tedious to do by hand. But because of the simple geometry, SOLIDWORKS can be relied upon to give uh, accurate numbers that, that at least tell us that the wax is behaving like we expect it. So if you look at the temperatures that the wax reaches, the hottest that it reaches is 150 degrees Celsius and the lowest temperature at the end of 30 minutes is 51 degrees Celsius. Now the melting temperature of paraffin wax is around 60 degrees Celsius. So most of this block is melted at the end of 30 minutes with just a little bit at the end for uh, cushion. And that little bit at the end is our factor of safety. So in Conclusion, for this simulation, it behaved just like we wanted it to. And the next uh, simulation was another thermal analysis, transient, but it was on the satellite wall uh, or the satellite structure itself. Uh, we scaled up our small satellite wall to make it as big as our frame uh, to kind of illustrate a worst case scenario. If the directed energy weapon attacked, attacked the corner uh, that you see there, because our PCM might not be able to reach that corner. It wouldn't be able to defend as well against uh, in, an incident attack. Uh, but this analysis showed that the heat conducted through the frame of the satellite doesn't reach any electrical components at the, say, at the bottom of the satellite. Uh, and those are the only ones that we would be worried about because all other areas of the satellite can be defended by our uh, PCM module. The last two analyses that we ran were static deflection analysis and uh, fatigue analysis on the satellite wall. Because if for some reason our linear actuator overextended, uh, it could potentially cause permanent deformation or some kind of failure in the satellite wall or over uh, repeated attacks, if it extends and uh, presses on the satellite wall a bunch, it could cause fatigue failure. Uh, so our, our static deflection analysis demonstrated uh, or showed that the satellite wall only deflected 0 0.005 millimeters, which is negligible. And our linear actuator, uh, or sorry, our fatigue analysis showed that uh, our satellite wall would last for well over a million cycles, a million cycles being the minimum uh, 
boundary for infinite life in fatigue analysis. So after we calculated our engineering analysis, we then performed a performance evaluation on the final design to ensure that it was reaching um, the required objective for our problem. So the first performance evaluation we did was on the PCM module individually. We did this to ensure that it was um, absorbing thermal energy um, as designed. And the way we did this is um, we inserted two thermocouples inside the paraffin wax within the PCM module, one towards the front and one in the middle. Then we put the PCM module on a hot plate and put large amounts of thermal energy into the system and we were able to look at the temperature, the resulting temperatures. So this first plot, on the, as you can see on the left, are three tests that we did on the, uh, in this manner. The first two tests were just uh, were done with smaller temperatures just to make sure the system was responding. And the third test was done with larger temperatures and was also allowed to cool to see the results. And the plot on the right is a more in-depth view of this third test. Um, this shows the temperature readings of each thermocouple. And as we can see, um, the, first the front thermocouple heats up rapidly, especially compared to the thermocouple in the middle. But the thermocouple in the middle does heat up eventually within a reasonable amount of time, showing that the thermal en energy is propagating through the entirety of the paraffin wax, um, and that it's also reaching temperatures in which it would melt. This also shows that um, it is also dissipating the thermal energy very rapidly as it is cooled, which is also important. And so this shows that our design is working properly. The next performance evaluation we did was on the system in its entirety. Now, fortunately, we don't have access to directed energy weapons, so we had to use a substitute. We used a 40 watt heater inside of an aluminum shell. We then placed this heater on the satellite wall and add some insulation to mitigate the effects of unwanted convection. After this, we turned the system on and allowed it to respond, and we measured the resulting temperature data. And, here's, and we plotted that data on this chart. The first test we did was a control sample in which the PCM module did not engage. And um, this is a worst case scenario in which the system did not respond at all. Then we um, put the heater at different locations on the satellite wall several different times and we averaged those results. Um, and as we can see here, the, they are less than the control value um, and so the PCM module engaging in the correct way did mitigate the effects of the thermal attack. We also took the average final temperature of each um, test, which is in this plot, yes. Um, and we can, and even though they're in different locations, um, it, we were found that they had, a, they all had a very similar effect on mitigating the thermal attack. And they're about 20, uh, they, um, lowered the temperature about 20 degrees compared to the control sample over this 30 minute duration attack. And so um, from this, we can tell that the PCM module is mitigating the thermal attack and um, that is working as intended. It should be noted that due to limited resources due to COVID-19, um, that we weren't able to purchase the precise heater that we wanted for this project. The heater was only able to heat the wall to 65 degrees Celsius, which is 100, about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is the onset of melting. So the paraffin wax didn't melt completely. So, um, but it does show that this does work and that if we did put larger thermal loads that it would absorb even more thermal energy. Speak up, you have less than two minutes. Mm -hmm. So, and this is our final budget. Um, we spent $529 and had $220 left over, which shows that this is fairly economical compared to space applications. And then for um, final, our final thoughts on the project, we have a few things that we'd like to tweak in the future. Definitely an improved heat source for better testing. We also um, would like to enhance the PCM module with a metal foam inside the wax to spread the thermal energy even more effectively than it already is. And then finally, future iterations of this project um, will be, it'll be cool to see future iterations of this project done. And in conclusion, um, this project shows um, this type of design has great potential in defending against directed energy weapons and can help um, every, in every sector that relies upon satellites. We also have a lot of people to thank. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time, but here they are right here. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? 
Thank you, speakers. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, Kirk, go ahead and unmute you. You can speak. Kirk. Kirk, do you have a question? Kirk, your, your microphone is off. How about now? There we go. Golly, it's like four buttons. Sorry. Um, guys, thanks so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm a, a spatial guy right out of college, so I, uh, it, it speaks to me. Um, question, what were your considerations for natural thermal cycles in orbit? Um, for instance, if you're a CubeSat and you're in sunlight versus the Earth's shadow, any degradation in performance, what do you, what do you see for there? Did you consider that? Thank you for your question. Uh, that is definitely um, something that we have considered. Um, are we, um, well, we, one thing we considered is that um, the existing satellites that we would add the system onto are certainly designed to withstand this. Um, but in terms of having it not confuse our sensing, our control system, uh, that is definitely um, something that we would look at in future iterations of this project. Um, I believe we would look at a lot of the data and um, help it our, and have the system um, adjust the threshold of what it considers they attack based on um, what time of day it is. Or, and since they are cyclic in nature, um, they're and somewhat predictable in that way. Um, but future um, future study, our future data could definitely be explored regarding that. Okay, so again, if you have questions, audience, um, you can put it in the chat and I can either unmute you or I can ask it on your behalf. Another question here from uh, Brendan Doran. Brendan, you're free to speak now. Ah, oh, sweet, thanks. All right, so uh, I was looking at your simulation results versus your final experimental results, and there's a pretty big gap in the temperatures, the average temperatures that we were seeing there. Uh, just wanted to see if y'all could talk to some of the non-idealities that you think might be contributing to that difference. Um, the difference between different tests, if I understand. Uh, so looking at the, so the SOLIDWORKS simulation where you showed the temperature of the paraffin wax uh, when you were assuming it as a cube and loading it from the front face versus when you applied the block heater to the front face of the PCM module and saw the average temperature. Uh, here in the simulation it looks a little bit lower from what I can tell, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, okay, so I can actually I can actually speak to that. So um, we actually the temperature is higher in our uh, PCM like SolidWorks simulation, but as we were saying like in our presentation, we weren't able to get the heater we wanted. So this is using the conditions that our sponsor gave us for the simulation. So if all the energy is going into our PCM from the directed energy weapon, that's the temperature and melting front that's gonna be on our, in our, uh, in our solid or well, uh, in our phase change. And um, if you look at our tests, since we didn't have a powerful enough heater, we weren't able to get results that um, showed the experimental version of that. Does that answer your question? Uh, a bit, I think I see, I see a little bit difference now that you're talking about. There are also thermal losses due to testing um, that we want to, that we will definitely explore as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we got another question here from Kevin Hall. Kevin, I'm going to go ahead and unmute both of your accounts here. I don't know which one you're using. Okay, thank you. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, in space, uh, in order to cool um, some type of heated part or something in space, you can't necessarily use convection cooling. So they have to radiate, radiate all of the heat away uh, in the infrared, usually. Um, and this requires very, very large radiative heat, like heat dispersers for a very small amount of heat, like on the space station. Uh, part of this project, it seems that you want to capture any type of heat from an attack and then get it away from the sensitive equipment um, how do you plan to do that uh, if the heat is um, a very large amount for something like a CubeSat? Yeah, well, thank you for your question, Kevin. 
that's definitely an important aspect to one of these systems is that yes, the, it would have to be radiated in order to really be, um, and that, that wasn't exactly in the scope of this particular project, um, but it will definitely have to be explored in future iterations of this project. Um, so yes, it would, um, the PCM module will absorb um, the thermal energy and it will have to be um, eventually disposed of, I would imagine through radiation um, at some point, but um, as of now, it is protecting the, the very sensitive electronics. Um, and that was the objective of this particular project, but that- Okay, like, one, yeah, that one makes thing sense. One we had considered is that the, uh, you know, it's basically uh, the, it, just like you can, you know, our, our thermocouples are programmed to, to uh, find the hottest point, you know, and, and locate where that is. It's, it's kind of just a reversal of the code to find the coldest point on the satellite wall. Um, depending on the size of the satellite wall, that would, that temperature would, uh, would differ. But um, for, for a, a standard, uh, a fairly sizable satellite wall, um, the PCM would be able to go to the coldest uh, part of the satellite wall away from the attack and apply itself uh, to, to the wall. And it wouldn't be dumping um, the energy at the same rate as the, um, as the directed energy weapon. So it would allow that heat to, to radiate uh, away kind of slowly um, and re-solidify the wax. Now, you know, I say that and we haven't, we haven't tested that fully, but uh, you remember um, if we go back to our hot plate tests where we, we saw the uh, heat front advancing through the satellite wall, we did do one test where we placed it on a cool Play that was room temperature and the PCM uh, temperature dropped off dramatically. So that's a potential uh, solution. But again, like Luke said, it wasn't in the scope of our project. So we didn't investigate that any further. But again, thank you for your question. I got time for maybe one more, two more questions. I'm going to ask one real quick. If anyone has a question, you can put in the chat. Um, regarding the paraffin wax, you, you said it melts at 60 degrees and you show a pretty sizable temperature difference. Did you account for any changes in thermal properties when it transitions from a solid to a liquid? So is there any change in the thermal conductivity or thermal permissivity of the, of the material? All right, so uh, we actually, uh, we're doing studies and paraffin wax uh, is pretty consistent with its um, therm like its material properties when it uh, melts. But when we did account for um, the melting of the PCM in our SOLIDWORKS simulation, so uh, actually um, Luke uh, adjusted the properties. So when it reached a certain point, uh, the the material properties would change. If Luke, you want to touch on that? Um, a large portion of that was just changing the heat capacity um, when it was melting because it can absorb a lot of energy during phase change. Um, so we used existing data on that to adjust the models um, to match the material properties. Um, so. And then one more question adding on to that. Um, what about any expansion? Does it, does it expand at all when it's the typically the liquid uh, when it's heated up, does it have any kind of expansion? Uh, I can uh, answer that. So yes, when it does melt, uh, well actually when it melts, it doesn't expand, but as mu that much, it expands more when it's solid, actually if I remember correctly, than if when it's melted. However, um, that is accounted for in the neoprene bladder so that it doesn't damage the structure at all. Uh, and uh, the neoprene um, fatigue like it, it'll handle well over a million cycles. We got one more question here from Colin Wicks. I'm going to ask him on this on his behalf. Was thermal shock taken into consideration? Um, in some, it's I guess I would have to maybe ask a little more clarification. But um, in certain aspects, um, it. Um, it certainly was, um, but mostly due to the struck, like in terms of structural thermal stresses, um, those were found to not be very substantial. Um, but. Right. 
Well, we are out of time, guys. Um, so for our audience members, if you do have additional questions, it'll probably be time at the end of our session uh, if you'd like to chat with our students. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and get go ahead and get the next group up and running. So again, thank you, speakers. Um, we'll go ahead and get our next group up and running here. So our next group is the Skidder Tire Mount Frame Group. Uh, you should already be uh, listed as co-host. And make sure you are unmuted here. OK, guys, y'all are unmuted. So y'all can go ahead and get the presentation up and running. Okay, can I record that? Talk and go. Awesome. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Peter. Uh, I know this has lasted quite a while. Some of you guys have stayed for uh, the whole time. That's uh, really appreciated. Thanks for sticking around. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Peter. I'm joined with my teammates, Matthew Bryant, Jared Gillum, and Damon Moody. Um, this quarter, I was a uh, design engineer, but the uh, one of the aspects of senior design is that we actually we take turns. So fall quarter, I was the team lead. Last quarter, I was procurement. So we, we all get a different taste of uh, the different roles that there are uh, for senior design. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our project sponsor, uh, as well as the project itself, and some of our first uh, designer iterations. So our sponsor is uh, Walpole Tire and Service. It's one of the largest uh, car service um, providers here in Ruston. Uh, it's not that far from campus, a few minutes away. So that was that was great for us, uh, at least before you know COVID-19. Um, it was established in 1956 by Jay and Walpole. Um, they actually have two locations. The other is in Monroe, uh, although we we work exclusively with the uh, the Ruston location. Uh, today it's run by Neil. Uh, Jay and Danny. Uh, I'm not sure if Jay was able to make it uh, today, but he we did most of our uh, dealings with Jay. Um, and here on the bottom, you can see uh, what it looks like today. Uh, so I was relatively unfamiliar with skitter tires before uh, this project, so it was a, definitely a learning experience for me. But for anyone who uh, may not know what a skitter tire is, it's a, a forestry tire. Uh, these two pictures, it's a little difficult to see, well, I guess the second one, you can see how large it is in comparison to those uh, trees, but these are these are really big tires. These are, you know, it can be about 80 inches tall uh, and weigh over a ton. So this is uh, some pretty heavy duty equipment that we're dealing with. Uh, so Walpo approached us and uh, basically the problem that they're having is uh, one service that Walpo provides is changing these skitter tires out. And um, a lot of times what will happen is uh, they'll either go out on the, to the field and change the tire um, on the machine, or sometimes the tire will be brought in house, and uh, that is what really the 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 scope of our project was to design something uh, for these in house uh, scooter tire changes. Um, and the fundamental issue is um, these tires that are brought, uh, the 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 operators have no leverage on them. So the current method, it takes around three hours for three or four mechanics to for lack of better words, just kind of whack at it with hammers and try to try to get that tire off. And it's it's a, a rather inef inefficient method just in that, you know, that really is the best you can do without having leverage on the tire. Um, so uh, we started out with some, it was a rather open-ended project from the get-go, but, you know, there were some given specifications. Uh, the max wheel weight was, uh, was uh, 2,000 pounds. Uh, the, uh, the max tire OD was 80 inches, and uh, the pilot hole sizes ranged from 9 to 15 inches. And you can see on the right here, uh, we have these call outs next to a scooter tire. So when I reference the rim, it's the yellow part. The tire is, uh, you know, obviously the tire. Um, and I have an arrow going to uh, what's called the bead. So when you change a tire, you have to do what's uh, called breaking the bead. Um, so there's a, essentially uh, a layer of adhesive that is in contact that connects the rim and the tire. Um, so when you go to change a tire, you have to do what's called breaking the bead. Um, and uh, yes, there was a wide variety of, variety of lug hole patterns and sizes. So uh, from the start, we we suspected that our, our moving forward, it was going, we were gonna engage that pilot hole. That was gonna be how we were gonna secure these tires. Um, so we had some operating constraints. Um, our goal was that you know, whatever this ended up looking like, uh, it could be operated by 
one or two mechanics and hopefully take less than an hour, which, which would be a huge improvement to their current system of changing scooter tires. Um, so what you can see here is a, a boom truck that Walpole owns. So when they would go change these scooter tires out in the field, uh, it's like I said, it's easy because they have leverage against the tractor and they'll use this boom truck. Uh, it's a hydraulic arm to essentially punch that tire and break the bead and it's, it's easy. One guy can do it in around 30 minutes. So the, the hope was that they would be able to use this boom truck in-house uh, on this on some sort of apparatus that would give it leverage. And I'm gonna hand it off to Jerry. He's gonna talk about some of our first uh, design iteration. Hi guys. Um, so as Peter mentioned, uh, it's, uh, these are a couple of our initial design uh, alternatives. And uh, when we were running with this idea uh, our initial uh, instructions from our actual contact at Walpole was to uh, have an axle so that the uh, wheels themselves would be able to spin uh, freewheel much like they would on a vehicle. Um, and so we designed these structures to kind of support that axle and support the load of the wheel. Um, in talking with the technicians that actually changed the tire and some further discussions, they actually said that it would be best if absolutely no rotation was uh, available. Um, and actually they wanted it to be locked in position. So we had to actually um, move forward from these designs. Um, go ahead and the next slide. So, uh, and, and looking at the old designs, um, we noticed that uh, most couple, at least the heavily built one, uh, the material and manufacturer cost would be extremely high due to just, uh, you notice there were a, a ton of uh, short members there um, and they'd both be pretty inefficient. Um, and both of those were kind of designed on interfacing with the lug holes on the tires, on the wheels. And um, that was not gonna be an efficient process either with the wide variety of patterns on the bolt holes. So we actually moved on to a design um, like what we see in this picture here. Um, and so this is a single uh, W-class I-beam structure, uh, base structure. And so what it is, is that a uh, beam is actually set in concrete underground, uh, similar to how you might set a uh, fence post. And then we uh, had a upper support statically welded onto that W beam. And then a sled um, was manufactured in order to slide up and down hydraulically. Um, and that would allow us to actually interface inside the pilot holes um, and essentially use the two pipes as jaws that would open in order to uh, clamp down onto the tire itself or the wheel, the rim itself. Um, next slide. So this is there's a continuation of that and a couple more views. Um, so we decided to put the hydraulics on the back of the system. Um, and that is uh, very important because that will allow when, when the tire is resting simply on the top pipe, uh, it is not completely secured. And so by putting the hydraulics on the back of the system, we would actually be able to have the uh, operators uh, not in danger of having a load dropped on them if uh, some piece of the tractor or this design were crit to critically fail and drop the load. Um, and so we also designed, uh, if you see in the far, most, far rightmost uh, picture, we have chain securing mounts. And these were designed in order to uh, secure some chains behind the system. And then we would use eye bolts connected to those chains in order to go into the lug holes of the system and restrain the uh, rim against the actual I-beam itself. Um, so just a couple of our hydraulics, we used a double action pump. And this pump uh, with a flip of a switch actually allows us to pump in two different directions. So we can actively pump the sled upwards and we can also actively pump the uh, sled downwards in order to actually provide a restraining force against the rim. Uh, our max system pressure is uh, operating at 2,500 PSI and we do have a gauge on the line in order to make sure that, that is not approached too closely. Um, and our piston we chose had a 10 inch stroke. Um, with, uh, stroke is the length of travel that the piston can make and so this would allow us to engage uh, the variety of pilot holes that we were told we would need to service. Hey, uh, this, uh, this following video is kind of a visualization of how the tire removal process would take place on this design. So first they're going to take the tractor 
Oh, there's just a quick display of the hydraulics moving there, but they'll take the tractor and move the whole tire there onto the apparatus with the hydraulics closed, which point the chains would secure it to the back of the apparatus and they will engage the bottom of the pilot hole with the hydraulic sled there and pressurize it. Then the uh, arm of the boom truck, uh, kind of visualized by the cylinder here, will be used to press on the top of the tire. It will break that adhesive seal there on the uh, bead. And at this point, uh, the tire can be removed from the apparatus, uh, the chains removed, the hydraulic slacked, and the rim then removed from the apparatus. Okay. So uh, with all the loading we're dealing with here, as uh, Peter mentioned, uh, 2,000 pound wheels. Uh, we wanted to go really in depth into our engineering analyses and we actually did 10 of them. Um, as you can see, there's a couple uh, that deal with soil, uh, concrete cracking, soil bearing for our concrete pile, as well as uh, s stuff for our chain mounts, our pump bracket. Uh, but the big thing that we wanted to focus on was our uh, upper mount pipe. As you can see here, we have deflection, weld, stress, and impact tests. Next slide. Um, this is going to be our critical loading member. It's going to have the, all the, the full weight of the tire on it, the 2,000 pound, as well as a retaining load that's applied by the hydraulics of about 600 pounds. Um, for our SOLIDWORKS simulation, we assumed a worst case scenario and applied this at the absolute end of that upper mount pipe. In reality, the rim should never really rest here uh, whenever it's in use, especially whenever that retaining load is applied. It should always be further along the pipe. But just to make sure that uh, the system can undergo extreme loading, we set it here. Uh, for static stress, we have the smallest factor of safety at 5.2 at that red hot spot. Uh, then we performed a weld analysis on the weld groups holding this together. Uh, again, it was the same loading, max weight retaining load. Uh, still applied at the very end, and our smallest factor safety here was a uh, 5.7. Uh, then we did deflection. Deflection was crucial here over a lot of other locations because under the load, if you had really excess deflection, you could see the tire sliding off of the structure, and that would put a lot of people in danger. Um, so again, same loading. We only had a maximum deflection of about 0.3 inches. This is a SolidWorks visualization, uh, so the magnitude is. Uh, magnified. Uh, we then wanted to do an impact study just as a fail safe for a freak accident event. Um, we talked to the operators and they could only foresee dropping it if the hydraulics on the tractor failed about a quarter of an inch. Um, we decided to quadruple that to an inch of drop height. Um, but in order to use our static loading uh, simulation software through SOLIDWORKS, we had to find a correction factor that would allow us to take an impact load and find its equivalent in a static load. And we used a uh, Rice University paper that actually uh, found the formula for a formula for this correction factor using the height of the drop H, a drop efficiency N, which is how the energy is transferred, um, and then the deflection that we found in the previous slide. And when you apply this into the formula, we get a correction factor about 0.377. Uh, you multiply this times the dead load of the tire, uh, which is about 2,000 pounds, as we noted earlier, giving us a simulated uh, impact static load of a bit over 7,500 pounds. Even then, uh, our smallest factor of safety is in the side welds, about 1.86. It's a little low, um, but being that those welds don't support the weight of the tire, the tire would still be suspended even if those welds failed and that it's above a factor of one, even in this freak accident scenario, it's, uh, we were very reassured by that. So we had two main, uh, or two main uh, sources of manufacturing uh, for this project. Our first phase was done in the winter quarter and that was done by Alpha Welding and Fabrication located in Shreveport. Uh, they did, as I said, a lot of our first phase fabrication uh, we chose them a lot because they had the, uh, the W beam we needed in stock and they could get it manufactured a lot quicker that way. Uh, they did a lot of the initial steel plate cutting. They welded that top piece together and onto the I beam, as well as uh, manufacturing that uh, hydraulic sled that we showed earlier. Uh, to install it at Walpole, we uh, hired an individual contractor uh, who came out and cut a two foot by two foot uh, hole in the slab behind uh, Walpole's Ruston location. Uh, they then dug a three and a half foot deep hole that was 18 inches in diameter. Um, 
and we placed the I-beam inside of that and filled in with concrete from Century Ready Mix. Uh, they had a Rustin plant and uh, their, their concrete mix definitely met all the expectations we found in our uh, soil bearing and cracking test, so it was a good choice. And now uh, Damon will cover some of our uh, spring fabrication and the effects of COVID. So uh, as you all can imagine, uh, the effects of the, uh, the kind of quarantine and everybody leaving campus in Ruston had some pretty major effects on our project as it was grounded on site here in Ruston uh, at Wolf Tire as of winter quarter. So majorly going into the quarter, we first had to petition for a budget increase from our sponsor from our original a budget of almost four grand to about 5,700. This was to cover some uh, estimated costs for additional outsourced fabrication that needed to be done, uh, remote procurement of hardware, and contracted labor for the actual assembly that would be taking place on site at Walpole as their schedule would not allow them to uh, be able to directly assist us with that matter. Um, so in addition, extensive communication plans necessary to enact these fiscal changes on the uh, grounded apparatus, and this greatly uh, extended our lead times for the uh, physical project completion. So some of the uh, updated elements that needed to take place uh, this, the quarter after the uh, quarantine was uh, we need to strengthen that uh, bottom sled, the hydraulically actuated sled. As during our initial demo, um, the plate on the front of the seat that was apparently too thin, we experienced some deflection there that we weren't quite liking. So we had that uh, part redone in addition to the creation of the chain mounting brackets and pump mounting brackets for the back of the apparatus. Uh, to perform this post uh, quarantine, uh, Manufacturing, we went to a bone manufacturing company in Arcadia. Uh, they were they're significantly close to our sponsor and made delivery of parts a lot easier for them uh, during this time instead of the other one being a Shreveport. And uh, they were capable of creating the, our uh, recreation of that engaging bracket and the fabrication of those chain pump brackets for us. Uh, here's just an example of some of the preparation assistance that we provided um, to uh, the people that were working with us at Walpole to perform the hole drilling in the back of the I-beam for these brackets. And in addition to members being on call and available to assist in this process as they're making that assembly. And here we go. This is the uh, completed apparatus. So this is what is currently on site at Walpole. Extended lead times pushed us to actually physically complete this just a couple days ago. Um, as a result of that and the fact that no skitter tires were present at Walpole to perform uh, actual tire removal on at this time, we haven't been able to perform any timed evaluations, but we were able to successfully demonstrate functionality of all the components, uh, the hydraulically actuated sled and the, uh, by mounting just a rim on there, which was then secured with the chains as well. Everything was nice, tight and snug against the apparatus and the operators at Walpole were very happy with what they saw. Just some possible future modifications as a result of our uh, after our final assembly and uh, being able to uh, mount a rim on the apparatus. Um, we would like to potentially see, or if they have any problems with the currently statically welded top pipe, um, it'd be possible to fabricate a replaceable um, top pipe there for if any fatigue or in the event of a critical situation like we mentioned earlier with the hydraulics dropping out on them uh, from the tractor and if any, any sort of damage is seen that way they can get a replaceable one up there. And in addition, uh, possible removal of the excess I-beam that we had at the top there, it was suggested by one of the operators that having a little bit more room up top might assist in their, the maneuverability of the tire. And just some broader impacts uh, of this project overall, um, kind of the whole basis of it is that they remove the tires entirely in the forestry industry. Just They just swap it out with a, another tire that's good to go, or the entire wheel actually, that's good to go and just ship off the damaged ones to wall tire that allows them to have less downtime in the forestry industry and keep going at what they're doing. At wall pole, this apparatus will be significantly less strenuous on the actual employees to use compared previously where they're bending over and pulling and trying to feed on a tire that's laying on the ground, these massive tires straining themselves. This will give them all the leverage they need to be able to do that um, with significantly less stress on their body. In addition to just, you know, saving employee time, this will be a significantly faster process. This will allow Walpole Tire to service additional clients. Two minutes, speakers. And at this point, I'd like to thank everybody for attending, kind of sticking with us and being here at the end to listen to our presentation of this project. And I'd like to ask if anybody has any questions. 
You're right. Uh, Dr. Chris, you're, you're on mute there. Yeah. Kirk, you had a question? I did. I did. Uh, thanks, guys. I appreciate the the uh, the presentation. I've <clears throat> been a Walpole customer for a long time, or have been until I moved to Texas. But uh, question about uh, budgeting activities and uh, having to go back and ask for more money. What did you learn from that? What are your What are your lessons learned? That is a tough conversation to have. Uh, I know, but uh, what what did you learn from that? Um, it, it definitely gave us some more experience because the budget for the projects was determined ahead of time before we even accepted the project. We didn't have any kind of estimation of budget. This kind of gave us some experience in kind of trying to look ahead and estimate how much things are going to cost, what we can expect um, now given the change in circumstances. And I, I think that will give us a lot of experience going forward in other careers whenever we'll actually be creating the budgets likely for projects uh, given that knowledge of our, our knowledge of a project. Another question here from Ms. Leslie McKeever. Uh, Leslie, you should be free to speak. Great, great job, guys. Um, so when I'm, I'm looking at this, this looks like a really awesome project. And I'm really wondering if you're concerned about the wear of your jaws at all, and if that was taken into account with uh, the design. So um, as for wear and kind of like a since they do not service skitter tires at Walpole very often. They're mainly, um, they mainly do like kind of 16, 18 wheeler uh, trucks in addition to civilian vehicle tires. Um, they get like, for example, we didn't even have any tires um, available on site at the time just to do that uh, testing on for the time performance. Um, but lo looking at that, so it won't be engaged very frequently in addition to the fact that that's kind of some of one of our modifications that we're looking at going forward, if we'd like to eventually remove that static jaw that's there and replace it with um, one that can be bolted to the frame and be replaceable if in any event uh, fatigue wear is noticed. Mm -hmm. Ryan, a, a contact stress analysis definitely would be possible. I mean, admittedly, that's not even something I considered. It's a great question. So in the future, that definitely could be something we look at. Another question here from uh, Mr. David Craig, I'll ask on his behalf. Was a tapered shape considered for the clamping jaws to assist with keeping the rim in place? So um, as for keeping the, uh, the rim in place, th that is mainly where those securing chains come in and keeping everything, uh, yes, with the securing chains come in to make sure that tire doesn't get pulled or the wheel itself doesn't get pulled forward as they're pulling on it with the uh, hydraulic hook. Um, in addition to that, uh, with the current size of the pipe that we have on there, um, it is only just whenever fully closed, a little bit smaller than the clearance on our smallest pilot hole that we were given in our range of pilot hole sizes. So um, having it at its current size would allow them to be able to slide it on without having to worry about contacting the front of it or having a hard time actually mounting the tire on it once they get it suspended with the track. We have any additional questions? Again, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand uh, and I can unmute you. I see a raised hand. Just a raised Jessica. hand. There we go. Chester, you can speak. Hey guys, uh, did you guys write up any like operations manual or safety precautions i heard high pressures uh, obviously there's a lot of forces involved there's some safety procedures with the chains like you know is it the kind of thing that if they want to move fast they might be tempted to to shortcut some necessary tasks that they're you know until this new unit not used to performing yes absolutely we have a, a user manual and safety precautions uh, listed in our final report that will be uh, delivered to before they start using the apparatus. Absolutely. Gotcha. Any additional questions from our audience? Let's 
Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much for your presentation today. Thank you to all our student speakers. Um, you know, I'll go ahead and let's do this. I'll, I'll unmute everyone and y'all can give them a, an applause uh, for their presentations today. Again, thank you so much, everyone. Um, just a reminder for everyone, the awards uh, for the mechanical engineering presentations will be at five o'clock. I'll try and put a quick link in the comments here so you can easily access it, but you can also find it on the senior conference webpage. Um, so that will happen at five o'clock. So we have about 30 minutes until then. Uh, I do encourage you to go if you have a chance. Um, students, again, thank you so much for your presentation. Y'all did a great job, uh, especially sort of collaborating with each other, working with each other sort of over distance. Uh, thank you to our, our advisory council members for showing up today uh, and sort of reviewing these presentations and giving them valuable feedback to, to them and as well as our department. And thank you to all our friends and families uh, that, that came and sort of watched, cheered on, uh, your, your child or your uh, family member, relative, friend. And thank you so much for joining us. So we are excited to have you all here. Um, and so if you would like, uh, I'm gonna leave the room open until five o'clock. Uh, you're more than welcome to sort of engage with people. I'll go ahead and open up chats if you want to ask a team. Uh, a question you can you know individually reach out to some of these team members and ask a question if they get a chance. David, you had a question? Well, I actually have a, a, a couple of statements. Um, number one, um, congratulations to uh, all the participants for making it through this phase. Uh, Dr. Reese, thank you for moderating for us this afternoon and uh, my group. Uh, please jump off and get in the other room so we can get this wash up session done before five o'clock. <laughs> Thanks. So again, advisory board, y'all have a meeting uh, for awards and all that. Peter left. A, oh. he left. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys. Okay. Good job students. Y'all did real well. Um, only about a week and a half before graduation, or before end of school, really. Another couple of months before graduation. <laughs> Almost there. Almost there. No. So. I was very disappointed in her performance. So again, if you are interested in attending the awards session, I will put a link here. So there is a link to our conference, senior design conference webpage. Um, if you go to the mechanical engineering presentations, um, there's a Zoom link for the awards. Uh, again, that starts at five o'clock. Um, you can actually go there now and just wait if you would like. Um, Dr. Cardenas, I believe, is the moderator for that session, but he might not be present. So again, thank you so much for everyone for showing up today. Thank you to our students for presenting, and I wish you all a uh, happy and healthy weekend. Stay healthy, and we hope to, to see you all again next year for our Senior Design Conference. <laughs>